This is PBS. Sunny day, sleeping up. jump out at me like that and that's what a surprise is when something happens that you're not expecting uh, I didn't want to surprise you I wanted to scare you why did you want to scare me because I'm a monster that's what monsters do you do want me to be the best monster I can be don't you yes I want you to be a great little monster <laughs> but uh this really isn't a good time for you to practice how to be a monster. You know, I'll, I'll never get this clock fixed for all that wobble, wobble, wobble going on. Uh, okay, Maria, I won't try to scare you anymore. Okay, good. <laughs> you surprised me again. I thought you weren't going to try to scare me anymore. I wasn't trying to scare you. I was trying to scare me. I need all the practice I can get. Wubba, wubba, wubba. Ooh. Ooh, that was pretty scary, don't you think? Ooh, wubba, wubba, wubba. Ooh very good. I'm getting good. Wubba, wubba, wubba. This looks wubba, like a wubba, good time wubba, wubba. for a coffee break. Wubba, wubba, wubba. Surprise! <laughs> Goodness gracious me, twiddle daughter Tina dearest, what a beautiful day! I am so glad I brought my beach umbrella so I can sit in the sand in the cool shade. That's nice, twiddle dad. Nice for you, but I do not a beach umbrella to sit under. Do you have one, Twiddle Brother Timmy? No, I don't. Do you have a beach umbrella, Twiddle Mommy? Oh, me? Oh, my. I certainly do not. I guess all of us, except you, my Twiddle dearest husband, will have to sit out in the hot, hot sun. Yes, I guess so. You do, Twiddle dearest daughter? Pray, tell us what is that way? We could cooperate and share the umbrella. <gasps> share the umbrella? Yes. It sounds daring, daughter darling, but I think we should try it. <laughs> It's working! Yay! Yes! And soon we can all go for a swim in the ocean! Yay! Uh, uh, Twiddle Dad, I have just one question to ask you before we go for a swim in the ocean. And what is that, Tina? 
Tina, my darling dear. Where exactly is the ocean? Huh? The ocean? Why, it's, uh, there? No, uh, there? No. Where is it? I don't know. It must be around here somewhere. Yeah. I don't see mm -hmm. any around here. Oh, look over this way. I didn't used to know that I was blind. It's just like keeping your eyes closed all the time. And but I uh, didn't understand it. Now I know. Let me take out your reader. Turn to page 145. Sylvia? Once upon a time, an old gray fisherman lived in an old gray hut beside an old gray sea. Would you like to continue from here? I shall keep this mackerel and fry it for my own, for my dinner. You, the old man. I read with my fingers. I put my fingers on the, some dots, and then I go over the dots, and they're put in different ways. And then the way that they are, that's the letter. It's time for some after you. Try to see if you can get the first row done in five minutes. In a little while, we'll have to I use add by using an abacus. Let's say the question was so two plus two. Them, I put two beads down from the right row, the and then I put another two beads down, and then I got four. That's all I have. I come home from school on the bus. Uh, the bus takes me to our farm. I live on a farm in Manitoba. And, um, play organ, that's an instrument, and that's music. And I just think of some music, and I try playing it and see if I can remember it. My dog Lassie, he came to me as a puppy, and uh, he was really very playful. I really like, I'd say playing with my cousin. My cousin, uh, his brother had three sheep, and then they got lambs, and then one of the lambs was called Jumpy. I like to feed my rabbit. You could try something to see if you were blind. Just close your eyes all the time. And you figure out what it means to be blind. It's just like a, couldn't see a thing. Or having your eyes closed like you're sleeping, but you're not asleep.
like that. What do you mean Indians don't talk like that? Indians talk just like that on TV, didn't they, Rick? 
Right. Well, no matter what you saw on TV with all those Uggs and me want I'm telling you Indians don't talk like that. Oh, oh yeah? Well, well, how do you know? I'm an Indian. Oh. You know, there are all kinds of creatures in the world, and they're all good in different ways. And a frog is a proud one to be. Yes, Mr. Clement. Well, now, just so you don't forget, here is an old frog folk song from Scotland. Oh. That I learned when I was about as small as you are now. Wow. And it goes like this. <clears throat> the nightingale sings such a beautiful tune. You can listen all night by the light of the moon. Now my song's not as pretty, but I'll say it again. I am proud to be one of the frogs in the glen. The butterfly is such a colorful thing with an orange and yellow and black on its wing. Now I am only green, but I'll say it again. I am proud to be one of the frogs in the glen. The deer can jump higher, the fish can swim faster than ever a froggy swam. But a deer can't dive deep, and a fish can't re-beep. So I'm proud to be what I am. Be proud of your flippers and the flies you can catch and the logs that you leap and the eggs you will hatch. We're under the stars and we're smaller than men, but I'm proud to be one of the frogs in the glen. Now sing it with me, and we'll say it again. I am proud to be one of the frogs in the glen. Very good, kid. Always be proud of what you are, a frog. Okay, Mr. Kermit. wasn't nice. Look how scared Barkley is. Poor fella. Gee, I didn't know he'd get that scared. What should I do? I, I like Barkley. I don't want him to be scared of me. 
you can show him that he doesn't have to be afraid of you by talking softly to him. Oh, okay. Barkley. Barkley. It's okay, Barkley. Don't be scared. It's okay. Come here, boy. Come on. Yeah, come on. It's okay. Good boy. You can come here. Oh, good boy. Huh? Oh, don't be scared. It's okay. Don't don't be scared. Okay. Okay. Good boy. Linda says you can try to pet him. Oh, okay. Um, good dog. You don't have to be scared of me. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. You don't have to be scared. Yeah. I don't think Barkley's afraid of you anymore. <laughs> you know, I kind of like not being scary. <laughs> I'd like to tell you a poem I wrote about the dogs in my neighborhood. Flat dog, square dog, round dog, rolls. Earth dog, space dog, star dog, bowls. Big dog, little dog, giant dog, barks. Old dog, young dog, long dog, parks. Fast dog, slow dog, happy dog, flies, black dog, white dog, blue dog, cries, tall dog, short dog, scared dog, creeps, quiet dog, noisy dog, tired dog, sleep. I guess we should let sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> Street Country Music Festival presents Miss Hammy Swinette and her trash can. Sometimes it's hard to be a trash can when folks get bigger each day. Up! Down! 
Dr. Nancy Einstein unravels the mysteries of the ice cube. Where does it come from? Where does it go? Nancy Einstein puts ice cubes everywhere. She put one on the windowsill, she put one in her pocket, and one down her brother's back. She put one in the freezer, one in the wash, and one in a flower pot. By that time, her hands were so cold that she decided to stop. But when she went to get her ice cubes later, they were gone. All gone, except for the one in the freezer. Nancy Einstein learned something that day. Never put ice cubes down your brother's back. <laughs> Over in Jackson they feed the elk because it's, um, it's too snowy up there for them and it just gets too cold for the weak ones so um, they all come down to the feeding area and they just sort of like feed cows sort of like when they like when you feed cows they just like they feed an elk and stuff
Uh, waiter. Uh, I, Mr. Monster? I, uh, waiter, uh, I'd like to order a One a, moment. A, yeah. Uh, yes, sir, I'm ready now. What can I do for you? Yes, I'd like a bowl of chicken soup, please. Very good choice. You've been here before, haven't you? Uh, I'll be right back. One bowl of chicken soup, Charlie! That settles it. I don't know why I keep coming back to this place. This guy gives me a hard time every time I come in here. If it's not one thing, it's another. Okay, sir. Here we have your delicious oh. chicken soup. Yes, uh... Waiter! I, I can't eat this soup. You can't eat this soup? Why can't... Oh, of course not. I can feel it. It yeah. is too cold. I will get you another bowl of soup. I'm sorry, no, sir. I... No, that... Hey, uh, Charlie, how about a hot bowl this time, okay? Give the guy a break. Well, that settles it. From now on, I'm bringing my lunch to work in a paper sack. Okay, Every Charlie, I think you'll be time. happy this time. There you are, sir. Now, I... Have a good and hearty meal. Yes, but... Waiter! Oh, I bet it's too hot now. Okay, I'll blow no. on for you. The problem is, you there, see, there, you there, forgot to fine. bring... Oh, I forgot the salt, didn't I? Of no. course. The pepper. No. Uh, the crackers. No, no, no. Well, then tell me, why can't you eat the soup, sir? Why don't you taste it? Oh. All right, sir. The customer is always right. I shall taste it. Uh, where's the uh, spoon? Aha! Oh, I forgot the spoon. Oh! You can't eat soup without a spoon. I'm so sorry, sir. Wow. There's the spoon. Now. Uh, next time, when you want the spoon, ask for one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eleven, twelve, thirteen. Have you have you read this? Is it good? So this is a library. Whoa! Look at all these books. I never saw anything like this in the jungle. Chicago's never been to a library before. Linda says you should look around, see what you want. If you can't find it, she'll help you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Chicago, no! Chicago, what are you doing up there? Come down here this instant. But I'm hunting says he's oh, hunting. See. Oh, no, no, D don't worry. He's a, he's a vegetarian lion. He only hunts for vegetables. Chicago, there are no vegetables in the library, only books. Yeah, no, but I'm hunting for a book about vegetables. Yeah, see, I like reading about vegetables almost as much as I like eating them. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, oh. oh, he said he's looking oh. for a book about vegetables. No, Chicago, no, 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 oh, Chicago, no, wait. No. Chicago! Oh, oh. No, no, look, Linda said if you just come down here, she'll help you find the book that you're looking for. She's a librarian. That's what she's here for. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks, Linda. But I think I see a vegetable book now. Chicago, don't! Jump. Linda, do you have any books? about lion taming. It was an unusual case, that's for sure. A snake had come into my office because he had lost his end. He had a beginning, that's his head. 
and he had a middle, all knotted up. But his end was nowhere to be found. I took out my magnifying glass and it became clear what we had to do. Follow his coils. They were the only clue we had. The beginning of the snake followed me, his middle trailed behind. The snake's coils lay on the wrong side of the tracks in a rough part of town. But that didn't scare me. Through a dingy alley and down a dark staircase they lay, then straight into a nightclub. I was prepared for the worst. Inside, the band whooped it up while the coils danced with the crowd. I looked back at the snake's beginning. This looks like the place. His middle bounced up and down, excited. The coils led to the bandstand, and there, playing the drums, was the snake's end. Now we knew where the snake's beginning was, also his middle, and finally his end. They were together again at last, and that is the case's end. Oh! Oh! No! Oh! Ernie, what, the, the... Ernie, what are you watching? Oh, oh, it's a great old movie, Bert. What is it? Oh, it's called... It's just uh, Cowboys in Outer Space, Bert. Ooh. Look Ernie, at that. Ernie, uh, can't you do something else besides watch TV? I mean, you've been watching TV all day long. Uh, well, well, gee, uh, like what, Bert? I mean, it's raining outside, Bert. Well, I know it's raining, Ooh. but... Uh, but, Ernie, there are other things to do inside besides watching TV. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, well like what, Bert? Ah, oh, what? What? Look at that. Oh. Those are just uh, actors. Yeah, okay, Bert. I'm trying to think what else you can do. Um, Did you see that one, Bert? How about reading? How about reading? You can read. We got a lot of books here. Reading? Well, I don't know, Bert. I don't particularly feel like reading right now, Bert. Oh. Well. Ah. Um, ah. How about How about writing a story? Hey, that's good, Ernie. Writing a story, yeah. Writing a story? Wouldn't that be fun? You can write your very own story. Writing a story? Yeah. That's a pretty good idea, Bert. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, Bert, would you help me if, if I were to write a story? Would you help me? Well, yeah, I, I suppose I could give you ideas. I'll help you, sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, great. Great. <laughs> Terrific. Wow, no TV set on all day long. Oh, great. Hey, Bert. Huh? Can you give me a hand? A hand? Uh, yeah, well, what do you want? Okay, Ernie! Bert. Come on, Bert. What are you doing? Oh, we're writing a story, Bert. This is not writing a story. Well, uh, it's the first stage, Bert. It's planning uh, to write a story, Bert. So you can't just sit down and write a story. You have to plan to write it. And that's what I'm doing. You see? Now, we've got uh, paper. I'll take that paper, Bert. See, we have the paper to write on. And I have pencils right here to write with, Bert. <sighs> and then I have my handy-dandy pencil sharpener. And I have my eraser here. Uh, for any mistakes I might make, Bertsy, I can erase them. Uh -huh. And then I have uh, a waste paper basket to put it in. Uh, a waste paper basket. Uh, Bert, Bert, have you seen my waste paper basket? Ask me that again and look into my eyes. Oh, oh, Bert, have you seen my have you seen my waste? Oh, this is my waste paper basket. Of course, Bert. it's your waste basket. Oh, yes. Yeah. You put it on my head. Oh, thank you, Bert. Thank now, you. That, that's my waste paper basket for throwing stuff in when I make a mistake, you Terrific. see. Terrific. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, Ernie, Ernie. What? You have planned your whole adventure in writing a story. You that's true. You planned everything out to the mm -hmm. last detail. Right. All planned. Right. Okay, go to it. Okay, I'll see you around. Whoa, whoa wait, wait, wait. Well, where are you going? I'm going to go play outside in the puddles. But why? Well, you see, Bert, I can't think of anything to write right now, Bert. But when I do think of something, I have it all planned. And I, thanks to you, Bert, I couldn't have planned it without you. Some of the words that begin with I, they get to be quite tricky, like intersection and illegal, irritate and achy. Many words that begin with I are longer than itchy and into There's impossible and incredible and important too The letter I is quite a pip I think I'll take him on my trip We'll have some fun and do a flip Into my car away we'll zip I'm glad to be with the letter I Cause he's so irresistible Down, 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 
down, down, down, down, down, down, down. <laughs> okay, you guys, now listen up. Tell me, who's afraid of the big bad wolf? <laughs> <laughs> what? You mean no one's afraid of the big bad wolf? Oh, well, I, I really find that very difficult to believe. <laughs> oh, come, 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 come. Somebody must be afraid of the big bad wolf. <laughs> no? <laughs> I'm reading this book here about a pioneer who rode his horse all over the old frontier. Can read, can read a book, something you can read. A good book is all you need, and you can read. In this magazine, I read about a queen who likes to bounce all day on a trampoline. Can read, can read, a magazine you can read. A magazine's all you need, then you can read. In my newspaper, I just read about a guy who ate a thousand pieces of pumpkin pie can read can read a newspaper you can read a newspaper's all you need and you can read i'm reading this book here about a pioneer who wrote his magazine all over about the old frontier in my newspaper i just read read about Oh, but I want to. Um, could I play? Oh, no. 
Oh, what why did I say that? There? Now I'm so embarrassed. Oh, they're, oh they're gonna look at me. Oh, I know they're. Oh no, they're coming they? over. I don't know what to why say. Don't you come over and play with us. It's a great idea. Play with you? Well, I'd like to, but I. Oh, I don't know. I don't. I'm not really sure. I've never. I could try, but I. I just. Well, okay. Here I could. Look at that vegetable book Gordon's reading. The broccoli from another planet. Whoa, I want to read that. Ah! Chicago, what, what are you doing? What? what? I, I'm reading this book. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I caught it. I caught it. It's mine. It's mine. That's the law of the jungle. This is not a jungle. It's a library. We take turns here. Take turns? Right. You can read this book as soon as I'm done with it, okay? Sounds fair. <sighs> done yet? Almost. I've got one more page. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, now it's all yours. Okay, okay, great, great. Now just put it down right here. Right here, yeah. Why? I want to catch it. You don't have to catch it. I'm giving it to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's more fun to catch it. Put it down right here. Yeah, right there. <laughs> gotcha. Now I'll read you. Turkey's in the straw, turkey's in the straw. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Turkey's in the hay, turkey's in the hay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Turkey's in the tree, turkey's in the tree. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Yes, sir. Thirteen. Three thousand four hundred and nine sheep. Three thousand four hundred and ten sheep. Three thousand four hundred and eleven sheep. What? My sheep? Where are my sheep? Your sheep, my friend, are tired of jumping. Every night it's the same thing. Jump, jump, jump. Count, count, count. Well, we are tired of jumping. <laughs> We've had it. Sheep need sleep too, you know. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, I have no more sheep to count. And counting is what I love to do. I've already counted all my bats. Uh, I've counted the flowers on the bedspread, the spots on my pajamas. Oh, but wait, not to panic. Ah, yes. Here it is. 24 hour emergency counting service. We deliver. Ah, ah, the number, yes. Okay. Ah. Ah. Yes. Hello? Yes, operator. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, please. I love that number. Somehow it has a certain ring to it. Ah, ah. 24-hour emergency counting service. Yes, yes, uh, this is the count. I need somebody to count in a hurry. <coughs> My goodness, that is a hurry. Come in. Hey, uh, what seems to be the problem? Oh, I've run out of sheep to count. Oh, oh, well, I, I got just a thing for you. Yeah, well, we're, we're running a special on Swiss cheese. Count the holes, sleep like a baby. Oh, that's not enough for me to count. I am the count. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot. Uh, oh, look, look, I, I guarantee you count all the paper clips in this jar, you'll be snoring in dreamland in no time. <laughs> oh, oh, I'd finish those in no time. No, it's not enough. I really need, what I really want is more sheep to count. More sheep? Uh, more sheep. They always want more sheep. I was afraid of this. Okay, buddy, 
You just get a little comfy and cozy in your little bed. I'll be right back. Oh. I can hardly wait to start counting sheep again. Bah. Bah. Oh. Well, it's not perfect, but it'll have to do. Oh, boy, I hate this. <laughs> Ah! One pretend sheep. Ah! That's two. Two pretend sheep. Ah! <laughs> That's three. Three pretend sheep. Ah! Four. Four pretend sheep. Ah! Five pretend sheep. It's not an easy way to make a living. Six pretend sheep. He's getting tired. Seven pretend sheep. Ah, ah. Oh, I love it. Mm. A modern rhino who swung sweet and low on his mellow oboe. While Flo the hippo stood up on her big toe and spun her yo yo way up high and down low. A crow and her bow flew in from Ohio and danced the fandango in the meadow below. The crows, the hippo, and Calcutta Joe all stood in a row and sang Fodio Do, and together they sang Fodio Do. Knock, knock. Who's there? Dion. Dion, who? On you! <laughs> D. Danger. Danger. Draggy. 
dragon. dragon. Doctor. Doctor. Dinner. Dinner. Dessert. Dessert. D. D. <laughs> oh yeah, this is great. It's okay. He's a friendly lion. He's friendly. He's friendly. Oh, okay. Everyone, friendly oh, lion. He's friendly. Oh yeah. Oh. Chicago. Mm. Shh. What, what? What? You're roaring. I am. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. It's just this book is so funny. I had to roar. Yes, yes. But but uh, you're not supposed to roar in the library. Remember, you have to be quiet so that you don't bother the other people. Oh, oh, oh. I, I see. Yeah. Quiet, yeah, right, quiet. Folks, folks, it's it's okay. It's okay. Oh. Come back, come back. It's it's just the way he laughs. <laughs> oh, Chicago, mm. you're doing it again. Oh, I can't help it. This is the funniest book I ever read. I can't stop roaring. Well, listen, I have a good idea. Why don't you take the book home with you? See, then you can roar as much as you want. I can take this book home? Yeah. So you just borrow it and bring it back when you're done. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah, I get to borrow the book. I'm so happy I could roar! Sesame Street has been brought to you today by the letters D and I and by the number 13. Sesame Street is a production of the Children's Television Workshop. Hey, where'd everyone go? Funding for this program is provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by public television stations and their contributors.
just like grown-ups use to drink coffee or tea. <laughs> well, you know, some Zubus believe in another kind of saucer, one that flies, and it's not an airplane. No, it's from outer space, way, way up in the sky. <laughs> now, not all Zubus believe in flying saucers, but look how it does. And today, we're going to find out what happens when he takes a picture of one, and strange things begin to happen in Zubuli Zoo. <laughs> I can't wait. Here's the footage I shot when I took that trip to find the wild geese. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah. Uh, and your pictures are very good. Well, thanks. Wait a minute, what's that? Well, how should we know? You took the pictures. No, I dropped the camera, and I guess the tape kept rolling. It's, it's flying, but uh, uh, it doesn't look like a bird. It's not a bird. No. You know what that is? What? <laughs> I suppose you're going to tell us that it's a flying saucer with, <laughs> with an alien space creature on board. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. It's the first flying saucer ever to be seen in Jubilee Zoo. Oh, now look out. Uh, you're dreaming. You're dreaming, my, my lad. You're dreaming. It's not... There are no such thing as flying saucers. No, no, except, except in the movies. Look out. I, I think you need a rest, you yes, know? Yes, a rest, You've yes. been working hard. Working hard? Uh, going from one adventure to another? And, right. uh, you should why take, don't you take a little rest? Yeah, take time off. Relax. Are you kidding? Relax? Oh, when there's probably a space creature from that flying saucer roaming around Zoobly Zoo right now? Oh, oh, I'm sorry I'm late. Oh, oh, oh boy, did I miss your pictures? Oh, oh, oh they were wonderful, was that? And oh. why, we saw a bird that it was prettier than any of my close personal relatives. Oh, but that's not all, was that? Oh, I saw a flying saucer. Oh, oh, let me tell you why I'm late. Oh, you'll never believe it. I opened my door and this is what I found on my doorstep. Oh, it's a glove, a giant glove. There's nobody in Zoobly Zoo big enough to wear a glove like that. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, now look out. You're dreaming again. Hi, guys. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry I'm late. Oh, but the strangest thing happened this morning when I opened my door. I tripped over this thing on my doorstep. Uh, it's a comb. And look at the size of it. Yeah. I thought it was a prop for one of your plays, Bravo, so I brought it along with me. Boy, I've got as much hair as anybody in Zubli Zoo, and I don't use a comb this big. Boy, whoever uses a comb that big must have a head this big. I'll tell you who uses a comb that big. A space creature from that flying saucer I saw. That's who. Uh, did you say creature? Oh, from a flying saucer? <laughs> <laughs> about flying saucers. Well, that's what Lookout believes. He thinks that a flying saucer has landed here in Zoobly Zoo. Boy, this truck is really stuck, Bravo. We may have to blast it open. Yeah, well, you know, he thinks that that giant comb and that huge glove were left by a creature from a flying saucer. that's a laugh! Well, how you doing? Did you get the trunk open? No. Bill, you have to open this trunk. I have to get my, my costumes and props out for tonight's show. I have an idea. Uh, bring me the file. 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 Oh, and the hammer. 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 Oh, 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 and the knife. 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 Oh, and the peanut butter. Peanut butter? Trust me. Peanut butter. Well, did you get it open yet? No, but the sandwich sure is good. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I think we're going to need a very special tool to get this open. Something like, like a crowbar. Or we can run into that creature from the flying saucer, and it can open it up with its pinky finger. Ha, 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 flying saucers in Zoobly Zoo. That's the silliest thing I ever heard. Ha, 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 ha. Bill, Bill, look what I just found on my doorstep. Hope it's a crowbar. Eeks! It's a giant belt to hold up some giant pants. Well, uh, nobody in Zoobly Zoo wears a belt this big. This must belong to, 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 uh... A creature from a flying saucer. A creature 
from a flying saucer? A pizza from a flying saucer! Look out, that's me, and the world of adventure is where I gotta be. Traveling is fun, woohoo, cause I'm in the different all the things I've never done. Fun things about the way, which way is that? Hey, wait a minute! Who's the clown playing a joke on me? I put my eggs right here! Hmm, that's funny. The eggs can't just get up and walk away. The pan didn't have any legs. Hmm. Well, maybe Bravo's right. Maybe I am working too hard. Well, better go get some more. Hey! Ah, oh. oh, now my plate's gone. I don't get this. Ah, oh, first my eggs, then my plate. Ah, oh, they couldn't just get up and walk away. Plates and pans don't have legs. Hmm, what's well, gotta be here somewhere? Oh, oh where could it be? Oh. Oh. Gee, I don't know. Getting woods. Oh, who are you? Me? I'm Ugo. Where are you from? <laughs> I'm a space bus driver. I go from planet to planet, star to star, Route 5, Venus to Mars, with the free transfer to the Milky Way. Hey, listen, you won't tell my boss I got lost, will you? He'll get mad and I'll get fired. I, I don't believe this. <laughs> Where's my camera? Well, you better believe this. My boss is a tough snookle. Why, when my ship got a flat spotus, he was really mad. No, I, I mean, I, I don't believe you're here. Well, I had to go somewhere to find my way home. Oh, this is unbelievable. Have a cup, Oh. oh. Mm. Um, uh, no, no, thanks. Um, I ate some of your lunch. I hope you don't mind. Um, it wasn't near as good as Crumpkin's. <laughs> You're not at all what I expected. Big! You expected someone from outer space to be big! Yeah, big! And, and you know, weird! You're talking about big and weird? You should look in a mirror. Why do you think I've been hiding? Why do you think I left all those presents all over the place? You're the one that's been leaving all the presents on the doorsteps? Little friendship gifts. Wow. You know, I meet some strange kooks in outer space, and they're not all so friendly. Yeah. Well, you don't have to worry about us Zubles, Ergo. Uh, we'll be your friends. And I'll be your friend. And now that we've settled that, you wouldn't know how I could get to Bemis, would you? Well, where's Bemis? That's my place, where I'm from. It's up there. Oh. Well, I'm sorry, Ergo. I can't help you. Well, but let's go talk to a friend of mine. Maybe he can help. Is he weird? No, I think you'll really like him. Come on. Okay. <laughs> An actor to the very core is Bravo the Fox. The one the theater's waiting for is Bravo the Fox. Just watch me in a drama, giving everything I've got. Oh, this master of pretending I'm someone I am not. And when they drop the curtains and the evening is complete, I'll take my final bow and you'll be on your feet. With Bravos, Bravos, or Bravo the Fox. Oh, Bravo, I got a surprise for you. Well, I hope it's a crowbar. I seem to have misplaced mine, and hey, I Bravo. can't get this infernal trunk open. I, I brought a visitor, Bravo. A Bravo Fox, meet Ergo. Uh, ergo, please to... to... Ah! 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 No, 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 no. He's just surprised. Come on out, Bravo. Ergo's about the friendliest space creature you'd ever want to meet. 
Well, well who, who said I wanted to meet a, a friendly space creature anyway? Ah, come on, Bravo. Ergo was flying that flying saucer and she got lost. She needs directions home. You go down Main Street, take a left, and it's straight up from there. Didn't you like the friendship present I left on your doorstep? Friendship present? I hoped you'd enjoy it. Oh, you mean, you mean this belt? I don't know that that's a belt. That's a formus. Oh, a formus. <laughs> oh, I've always wanted one of those. <laughs> Thank you. What's a formus? Oh, don't be such a schnookle. It keeps the bed covers from coming off your feet at night. Oh, it does. Oh, what a wonderful idea. Very smart. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much, uh, Ergo. <laughs> thank um, you. I noticed you were having trouble opening your trunk. Yes, it's stuck. I can't get it open and my costumes for tonight's show are in there. I'd like to help if you'd let me. Well, sure. Go right ahead. Then trouble on its way. Good times are here to stay. And all you have to say is boo ba boo ba Oh, my! It's open! It's open! Oh, thank you! Thank you so much, I go! <laughs> you silly, silly machine! One more bad word out of you, I'm going to trash you in the toss can! Toss you in the trash can! Garbage! You get it? You get it? Hi, talking to! Hi! Hi, look out. You see, you brought a little friend with you. She'll be okay in a minute. You wouldn't know how I could get to Bemis, would you? Oh, oh, I knew I shouldn't have that last piece of Zubal cream ice cream. <laughs> have a pumpkin. It'll settle your stomach. Hey, it's no. okay, talking to. This is Ergo. She's a space creature from that flying saucer we saw on my videotape. Here I am, face to face, with the greatest story of my life. My computer's not working. Oh, don't worry, you're chroming about it. Stand back. back. Okay. Then travel on its way. Good times are here to stay. All you have to say is boo ba boo ah! <laughs> All set. from that flying saucer I told you about. Oh, wow. Really? Pleased to meet you, Ergo. I heard some very pretty noises when I came up. What do you call that? Oh, well, we call that music, but uh, I'm afraid it didn't sound very good because my instruments aren't working. Oh, well, maybe I could help. Allow me? Okay, sure. Send trouble on its way. Good times are here to stay. All you have to say is boom ba woo ba <laughs> Wow. Wow, let me try it now. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ergo. You're oh, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Your horse is getting a little bit tired. Oh, thanks a lot, 
look out. You Zoob will sure do know how to have fun. Oh, boy. Well, that's great having you around here, Ergo. Yeah, you sure changed our minds about creatures from outer space. <laughs> We're not afraid of them anymore, are we? Uh-oh. Oh, and I'm not afraid of Zoobles anymore. Oh, great. Oh, oh, Ergo, those presents you gave us were just great. I can't wait to use my comb. <laughs> Gee, you sure have funny names for things. That's not a comb, that's a foggle. A, a, a foggle? Uh-huh. What's a foggle? A foggle takes all the seeds out of watermelons, so you don't have to spit them out. That's ugly. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh and I can't wait to use my new glove. Uh -oh. Well, I didn't leave you a glove. That's a fortune. It keeps your hand from getting all wrinkled when you stay in the bathtub too long. Oh, <laughs> oh Ergo, I can't tell you how much fun it's been having you around. <laughs> oh, we wish that you could stay forever. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. That nifty song and dance you did made all our troubles go away. Well, it only works when I'm here. It won't work when I'm gone. Oh. It won't. No. But you should do it anyway. When you sing and dance, you don't worry. Huh? And when you don't worry, you don't have any trouble. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I wish I could stay longer, but I really have to go. Oh, uh, but Ergo, you still don't know how to get back to Bemis. Oh, well, I'll just take off. Some friendly space officer will give me directions. Uh, oh. Oh. Ergo, are you sure you can't stay? Are you kidding? That snookly spot of mine probably thinks I stole his bus. <laughs> <laughs> stole his bus. <laughs> <laughs> cookies to take on your trip, Ergo. Oh, thank you. Here. Gee, that is well. Here, have one. Mm. Not bad. Almost as good as Crumpton. <laughs> <laughs> Ergo, I sure hope you can come back and visit us. Oh, you bet. I get a two-week vacation this summer. I'll be oh. here. Oh, great. Bye-bye, <laughs> Ergo. Bye. 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 Have a good trip. Have a good trip. <laughs> I'm flying just conked out on me. Yeah. Yeah. Bill knows all about motors. Maybe he can help you. I'll go get him. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, I've got a better idea. Ergo, uh, go get back in the spaceship, okay? Okay, ciao. Bye-bye. Bye. What? Well, see, she made uh, our troubles go away. Maybe we could do the same for Ergo. Yeah, the song. It'll still work because she's still here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Send, Send trouble on, on its way. way. Good the times are here to stay. stay. All you have to say oh, is boo baroo <laughs> That works. Oh, oh, there she goes. Oh. Bye, Ergo. Bye-bye, Ergo. See ya. I don't know about you, but I'm gonna practice the Boobaroo Ba song. That's right, you know, Ergo was right. All you got to do is sing and dance, and all your troubles will go away. Yes, sing troubles away. Good times here to stay. All you got to say is Boobaroo Ba. Boobaroo Ba. Boobaroo Ba. Boobaroo Ba. I like this song. Boobaroo Ba. Boobaroo Ba. Boobaroo Ba. Magic and wonder are waiting for you. It's as close as a dream. Spend your lunchtime with Danny, Tracy, and the whole Partridge family today at noon, just before Mork and Mindy. Reach for the speed, reach for the whistle, go where the rail may run. Reach for the words, reach for the story, follow the rainbow sun. To a shining time station, where dreams can come true, waiting there for you. Win 
Hancock contest for the best slogan of the Indian Valley Railroad, then you are going to have to come up with your own slogan. So keep on thinking, huh? <gasps> I got it. What? I got it. What? How's this what? for our new contest winner? <clears throat> we got tracks to the max. Huh? <gasps> Trains on the brain. No. Yeah, How's this? Clickety clack, clickety clack, clickety 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 clack. Hey. Well, there's something to be hey. said for that clickety hey, clack. Hey, yo, stop it! 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 Quiet. I'm still working on mine. Well, now I think that quiet. my musicality. Quiet. And not another beep. Beep. Quiet, you. Beep. Stop it. Beep. You too? What's with all the beep? Beep. Beep. Oh, I get it. Beep. 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 That's it. Beep. 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 It's different. It's new. And it's exciting. We got it at last. Hmm. Think it'll win? Who cares? We all agree we like it. Hee-ha! And we had fun doing it. Then... And that's it. It's our new slogan for the Indian Valley Railroad. Now, <clears throat> peep, peep, peep. Toss it out there, and maybe someone will put it in the box for us. Here it goes. The official jukebox entry for the first prize. Woo! <laughs> Come on, hurry up, will you? I think they finished. I can't think of anything. I wish I knew what the heck they had written. Uncle Schemer, you can find out. <laughs> well, hello, children. Hi, Schemer. Hi, Schemer. Uh, what is it that you're writing? We're writing our slogan for the Indian Valley Railroad <gasps> Contest. Would you mind showing it to me? Should we show them what we wrote? I don't know. Mm. Sure, why not? Okay, but if you don't like it, you can't laugh. Promise? I promise over, under, sideways, and down. Cross my heart, lose my nickels. I will not laugh. Okay, okay we can show him. <clears throat> the Indian Valley Railroad. We may be small, but we're nice. Small, but we're nice. <laughs> wait, wait. Wait, wait. They say, they say we're small. Why do they say we're big? Yeah, big, yeah. And they say we're nice. Why don't I say we're nice? That doesn't work. We're not nice. Um, why don't I say we're mean? Big mean motion machine! Yes! That is it! That is it! We win victory! <laughs> All right! The contest is over. We win. I'm glad I thought of it. <laughs> the winning ballot. Hey, what does yours say? Wouldn't you like to know? Yeah. We're going to tell you? Like we don't have any brains in our heads? Well, we showed you ours. If I showed you this, you'd probably just twist it around and turn it into your own, right? No, we wouldn't. Well, okay. Do you wonder what we wrote? <laughs> the winning slogan. Victory is ours! <laughs> we won the first prize. We won the first prize. <laughs> Uncle Schemer, mm. what is the first prize? Gee, I'm not sure. Probably a big pile of money, like a hundred dollars. What if it's two hundred dollars? What if it's three hundred dollars? 
Slogan for the railroad contest. Yes. Oh, I'm having so much trouble. It's not that easy. What's in the basket? Oh, these are apples. They're from our trees outside the station. There's not very many of them. Oh, I know, I know. You know, they were planted a long time ago by someone, and nobody's taking care of them. So there's not much room for them to grow, so they don't produce that many apples. Ten away from Wadley. I'll be right back. One, two, three. Hey, look out there. I've already had my apple for the day, thank you. Hi, Mr. Conductor. Hi, everybody. Are you baking up an apple pie? No, these are all the apples we have left. Aunt Stacy said there's something wrong with the orchard. Oh, my, yes. I think those apple trees need some rest and repair. That was all Gordon needed. Was Gordon sick? No, but he had been working quite hard and was in need of a good rest. Who did his work? I'm glad you asked, because it was young James. Well, why don't I tell you the whole story? The island of Sodor had many visitors and Sir Topham Hatt had scheduled more trains. Gordon, the big engine, had to work harder than ever before. Come on, he called to the coaches. Come on, come on, come on. The passengers rely on me to be on time. Whenever Gordon finished one journey, it was time for another to begin. Never mind, he puffed. I like a long run to stretch my wheels. Even so, Sir Topham Hatt decided that Gordon needed a rest. James shall do your work, he said kindly. James was delighted. He liked to show off his smart red paint and was determined to be as fast as Gordon. You know, little Toby, he boasted, I'm an important engine. Everyone knows it. I'm as regular as clockwork. Never late. Always on time. That's me. Says you, replied Toby. Just then, Sir Topham had arrived. Your parts are worn, Toby, so you must go to the works to be mended. Can I take Henrietta, sir? No. What would the passengers do without her? Toby saw Percy by the water tower. Don't worry, Toby. I'll take care of Henrietta until you get back. Soon Toby was out on the main line. He clanked as he trundled along. He's a little engine with small wheels. His tanks don't hold much water. He had come a long way and began to feel thirsty. In the distance was a signal. Good, he thought. There's a station ahead. I can have a nice drink and a rest until James is passed. Toby was enjoying his drink when the signalman came up. He had never seen Toby before. Toby's driver tried to explain, but the new signalman wouldn't listen. We must clear the line for James with the express. You'll have to get more water at the next station. Hurrying used a lot of water and his tanks were soon empty. Poor Toby was out of steam and stranded on the main line. We must warn James, said the fireman. Then he saw Percy and Henrietta. Please, take me back to the station. It's an emergency. Henrietta hated leaving Toby. Never mind, said Percy. You're taking the fireman to warn James. That's a big help. Henrietta felt much better. James was fuming when he heard the news. I'm going to be late. My fault, said the signalman. I didn't understand about Toby. Now, James, said his driver, you'll have to push Toby. What, me? snorted James. Me? Push Toby and pull my train too? 
Grumbling dreadfully, James set off to find Toby. He came up behind Toby and gave him a bump. Get on, you! James had to work very hard. When he reached the workstation, he felt exhausted. Some children were on the platform. Coo! The express is late and it's got two engines. I think James couldn't pull it on his own, so Toby had to help him. Never mind, James, whispered Toby. They're only joking. <laughs> said James. Toby just smiled. So you see what a muddle and trouble there can be if engines like James and people like Schemer jump to the wrong conclusions? But after a rest, James was fresh and raring to go again, just like Gordon was. And speaking of raring to go, I must be off myself. I have to do my exercises. You're going to lift weights? No, my music exercises. Do re me. <laughs> oh, that sounded awful. I am flat. Can you see if anybody's picked up our entry and put it in the box? No, not yet, but wait. Here comes somebody. Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. Hey, kids! Kids! Which one of you have been polluting my arcade, huh? None of us. None of us. No, not us. Arcades. None of you, huh? Well, don't let it happen again. Hey, I got it. What if it's twelve hundred dollars? No, thirteen hundred. That's it. Thirteen. Oh, he threw it away. Ooh. All our hard work for nothing. What hard work you talking about? Why, all that yaying and booing. Hi, Billy. Hi, Billy. Howdy, gang. Billy, Stacy said those trees have stopped making apples. Oh, I think I can fix that. Billy, no! Gee, I wouldn't cut down those apple trees. <laughs> Some of those trees are the oldest apple trees in all of Indian Valley, but they got too many branches, and the roots aren't strong enough to feed the branches or grow apples. Who planted all those trees? Don't know exactly, but I'd like to think it was Johnny Appleseed. Johnny Appleseed? Mm -hmm. Who was he? No, well, he was a pioneer. Sort of like the pioneers you see on this mural. Come here. Yeah. Long before the railroad, or even before there were any towns to speak of, Johnny Appleseed was walking along the riverbanks, through the woods and the fields. He was planting apple trees wherever he went. He never asked for anything except for more apples, so that when he crossed the country, he could keep planting seeds all along the way. You see, he wanted to give something special to people. So when they came afterwards, that they would have a shady place to rest and find juicy apples to did Johnny Appleseed plant the trees outside Tranny Town Station? He sure could have. Wow. wow! Did people pay him to plant all those trees? Mm -mm -mm. Didn't care much for money. Some people are like that. Hey, watch where I'm going! And some aren't. Yeah. Hey, I got it. Maybe the prize is going to be $2,200. $2,300? That's incredible! Awesome! Yes, victory is ours. <laughs> hey, 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 out of the way, out of the way. Give us some room. Winners need room. Champions need room to grow. And, uh, what do losers need? A rock to hide under. <laughs> you haven't won yet. Hey, a mere technicality. And uh, we've already got a head start on the celebrating, as Schemey and I just got back from Barton Winslow's general store and bought out the entire thing of candy. <laughs> Hey, little schemey champion, dig into a 30-pound box of candy. 
Hey, I just can't wait until J.B. King Esquire announces the winner, and then we can collect our prize. And then I can uh, pay for the candy. Hey, what is the first prize? Uncle Skinner says it's $2,300. I never heard that. Hey, maybe it's $2,400. Wow, that sounds like a lot of money. Hey, wait a minute. If it's $2,400... That means we could buy this place. And could we do anything that we want with it? I think so, yes. Could we make the trains run backwards? <laughs> Who's gonna stop us? We could cut down those apple trees and make a giant parking lot with signs saying, this way to the arcade. Who's gonna stop us? Hey, that's our apple orchard. I don't care. Hey, we could throw spaghetti all over this picture. Hey, that's it. Mural, not just yours. Oh, yeah? Who's gonna stop us? <laughs> you gonna stop us? <laughs> Come on, Schemey. Let's go somewhere else where we can discuss our improvements for this dump. Come Uncle on. Schemey, I don't feel so good. Well, here. Have some of these licorice cherry balls. They'll make you feel better. Oh. They're not really going to do those things to Shining Time Station, are they? Not while I'm working here. Hey, is that your slogan for the contest? Mm -hmm. Do you want to hear it? Okay. Yeah. You're on the right track on the Indian Valley Railroad. That's oh, right. right. Yes, I right. like you. Well, good luck, everyone. May the best slogan win. Looks like you got yours done just in time, Stacy. <gasps> good day, Miss Jones. Missing two feathers? Well, it's time to find out what the winning slogan of the Indian Valley Railroad will be. Here they are, sir. Good, good. Um... I'd like to use your workshop, Mr. Two Feathers, to select the winning entry. Well, please do. Go ahead, Mr. King. I don't think we'll win. Do you think we'll win? We could win. You're right. We could win. Hey, you did your best. That's more important than winning. Oh, Billy, you trimmed the trees. Oh, they look much, much better now. How will you know if the trees are well again? Well, when the birds come back. You guys hear any birds? Yeah. No. Do you think Scammy could win and then rip up the orchard for a parking lot? Or throw spaghetti all over the wall? I wouldn't be too worried about Scammy. He hasn't won the contest yet. And if he does win, no one knows what the first prize is. He's acting just like those mischievous freight cars. Thomas had to learn all about them. What happened? Well, before Thomas knew where he was, they'd go running on ahead, just like Schemey. I'll tell you about it. Thomas the tank engine wouldn't stop being a nuisance. Night after night, he kept the other engines awake. I'm tired of pushing coaches. I want to see the world. The other engines didn't take much notice, for Thomas was a little engine with a long tongue. But one night, Edward came to the shed. He was a kind little engine and felt sorry for Thomas. I've got some freight cars to take home tomorrow. If you take them instead of me, I'll push coaches in the yard. Thank you, said Thomas. That will be nice. Next morning, Edward and Thomas asked their drivers, and when they said yes, Thomas ran off happily to find freight cars. Now, the freight cars are silly and noisy. They talk a lot and don't attend to what they are doing. And I'm sorry to say they play tricks on an engine who is not used to them. Edward knew all about the freight cars. He warned Thomas to be careful, but Thomas was too excited to listen. The shunter fastened the coupling, and when the signal dropped, Thomas was ready. The conductor blew his whistle, beep, beep, answered Thomas and started off. But the freight cars weren't ready. Oh, oh, they screamed. Wait, Thomas, wait. But Thomas wouldn't wait. Come on, come on, he puffed. All right, don't fuss. All right, don't fuss, grumbled the cars. Thomas began going faster and faster. Whee! he whistled as he rushed through Henry's tunnel.
Hurry, hurry, called Thomas. He was feeling very proud of himself. But the cars grew crosser and crosser. At last, Thomas slowed down as he came to Gordon's Hill. Steady now, steady, warned the driver as they reached the top. He began to put on the brakes. We're stopping, we're stopping, called Thomas. No, 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 answered the cars, bumping into each other. Go on, go on. Before the driver could stop them, they had pushed Thomas down the hill and were rattling and laughing behind him. Poor Thomas tried hard to stop them from making him go too fast. Stop pushing, stop pushing, he hissed. But the cars took no notice. Go on, go on, they giggled in their silly way. There's the station. Oh dear, what shall I do, cried Thomas. They rattled straight through and swerved into the goods yard. Thomas shut his eyes. I must stop. When he opened his eyes, he saw he had stopped just in front of the buffers. There, watching him, was Sir Topham Hatt. What are you doing here, Thomas? he asked. I've brought Edward's freight cars, Thomas answered. Why did you come so fast? I didn't mean to. I was pushed, said Thomas. You've got a lot to learn about freight cars, Thomas. After pushing them about here for a few weeks, you'll know almost as much about them as Edward. Then you'll be a really useful engine. Look, J.B. King is about to announce the winner. Good luck. All right, everyone, gather around. <laughs> now, just hold on. I've gone over all the entries, and uh, I've got two finalists here. Ooh, who I tell are you, they? Who I are just they? can't decide. Ooh. I like them both. This one says, "We may be small, but we're nice." There's something true and decent about that. On the other hand, we have the big, mean motion machine. I like the sound of that. May not be as true, but it's gutsy. Gutsy. I tell you what. I'm going to put these two entries into this basket, and whichever one I pick will be the winner. And the winner is Peep. 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 I like the sound of that. Yeah, it's different. Mm. All right, everybody stop saying peep, peep, peep. It's the birds. Maybe the birds have come back to the trees again. Does that mean the trees are going to be all right? Oh, it's sure a good sign. I've always wondered who planted those apple trees. It was Johnny Appleseed. Johnny Appleseed? Do you know that for a fact? No, but do you know for a fact he didn't plant them? Hmm, you have a point there. <laughs> Johnny Appleseed, huh? Oh, Mr. King, <laughs> the winning entry. Ah, yes, of course, back to business. Um, peep, peep, peep. Uh, that has a cheerful sound. <laughs> I like that in a railroad slogan. It gets my vote. <laughs> now, let's see, who wrote this winning entry? Uh... Tex, Rex, Didi, Tito, and Grace. Who are these people? So what do they win? $2,500? <laughs> Where in the name of brake fluid did you get that idea? <laughs> no, the uh, first prize is a ride with the engineer of the Rainbow Sun, the pride of the line. <laughs> yeah, Rainbow Sun. But since the winning entrants don't appear to be here, how would you kids like to go? Yes, I would like to. What about you? 
Oh, I don't feel so good. I want to write down. Would you like an apple? Well, what do you know? We won! Right. Yay! <laughs> Let's celebrate! Yeah, with a song! Of course, with a song! Uh-huh, a railroad <laughs> song! And a one, and a two! Riding on the city of New Orleans Illinois Central, Monday morning rail There are 15 cars and 15 restless riders Three conductors and 25 sacks of mail They're all out on southbound Odyssey And the train pulls out of Kankakee Rolls past the houses, farms and fields Passing towns that have no names and Freight yards full of old black men And the graveyards of rusting automobiles Singing good morning Yes, I'm the train they call the city of New Orleans And I'll be gone 500 miles when day is done And the sons of Pullman Porters, sons of engineers They ride the father's magic car but made of steam And mothers with their babes asleep go rocking to the gentle beat the rhythms of the rails is all they dream Just a singing Good morning America, how are ya? Saying don't you know me, I'm your native son And I'm the train they call the city of New Orleans I'll be gone 500 miles when day is done Night time on the city of New Orleans Changing cars in Memphis, Tennessee Oh, it's halfway home and we'll be there by morning Through the Mississippi darkness rolling to the sea Just a second, good night America, how are ya? Saying don't you know me, I'm your native son Well, I'm the train they call the city of New Orleans in the sky I can go twice as high Take a look It's in a book A reading rainbow I can go anywhere Friends to know And ways to grow A reading rainbow A reading rainbow. Reading Rainbow fans, now you can get all of your favorite Reading Rainbow titles from PBS Home Video. Just have mom or dad call 1-800-538-5856. <laughs> Reading Rainbow is made possible by a grant from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the National Science Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the financial support of viewers like you, and by a grant from Kellogg's, who reminds you to take time each day for reading. Butterfly in the sky, I can go twice as high. Take a look, it's in a book, a reading rainbow. I can go anywhere, friends to know and ways to grow, a reading rainbow. A reading rainbow, a reading rainbow, a reading rainbow. What a blizzard! I can't believe we're going rock climbing in this weather! It's a good thing we have this. Say 
<laughs> That's not in the script. <laughs> okay, everybody, let's reset. Take five, LeVar. <sighs> Hi. That mountain climbing scene looked pretty convincing, didn't it? But none of it was real. Usually, you can believe what you see, but sometimes your eyes can be deceived. Well, just take a look around this studio. That wind, the storm, even this rock is fake. They're all special effects designed to fool you. Let's take this snow, for example. It's plastic, and there's no big cloud up there sending it down. The plastic is sifted through a snow machine. It looks like a big mesh barrel, and when you crank it, the snow falls through the holes. You can sift the snow as slow or as fast as you want. Okay, Barbara, really crank it up. <laughs> now, this is great for regular snowfall, but if you really want to make it look like a blizzard, you have to see the wind blowing the snow. So, we have a wind machine. Wind, please. <laughs> now, this is what I call a blizzard. Huh. Now... Let's take a look at this scenery. There are some pretty cool tricks here, too. This rock is really a piece of hardened foam that's been sculpted to look like a rock. It's hollow behind, and it's propped up by these pieces of wood. Now, where did we get those mountains in the distance? This is where it really gets high-tech. This wall is painted a special color called Ultimate Blue. The blue is special because it can disappear and let another picture take its place. Ultimate Blue is the special ingredient that allows us to trick you into thinking there's a mountain in the background. But where does the mountain come from? It's a photograph. The camera takes a picture of the photo and it's electronically put in place of the blue wall. So, here's how it works. You put your scenery, like the rock, in front of an ultimate blue wall. Then, with the flick of a switch, you add your background. The blue wall never changes, but what you see on your TV screen does. Then all you have to do is add your actor and your special effects. Thank you. Okay, snow please. And action, Lamar. What a blizzard! I can't believe we're going rock climbing in this weather! It's a good thing we have this safety rope, otherwise we could get blown Right off this cliff! With a little television technology, we made you think I was caught in a snowstorm. So remember, you can't always believe what you see. And there's another way that your eyes can be fooled. It's called optical illusion. An optical illusion makes you think you see one thing when you really see another. The pictures in this book called Opt are all optical illusions. Opt is the kind of book that you can really get into. So, let's take a walk in the land of Opt. Opt, an illusionary tale by Arlene and Joseph Baum. Here I am in the land of Opt, where optical illusions are everywhere. Take this envelope, for example. Look at the red and the blue lines. Which one is longer? 
Is it the red line or the blue? Actually, the lines are the same size. They only look different when seen against the background of the envelope. The line in the center divides the envelope into a big box and a little box. So even though the red and the blue lines are equal, your eye assumes that the bigger box has a longer line. It's just an optical illusion. What about these lines with the arrows? Are they the same or different sizes? The bottom line is longer, don't you think? <laughs> well, what do you think now? They're the same. It's tricky, I know, but when the ends of the arrows face out, you think the line looks longer. It isn't really, but it looks that way to your eye. As a castle guard, I cherish my trident. And I especially love this one. How many prongs do you see? There are two on the bottom, and on the top, three. Two on the bottom, and on the top, three. A trident like this one can only be drawn. It could never exist in real life. Flowers fair, flowers bright. Which flower has the larger center, the black or the white? The black one looks bigger because it's surrounded by small circles. The white center looks smaller because it's surrounded by big circles. Here, I'll prove it. See, the flower centers are really the same size. Optical illusions are fun to look at and they're fun to make. Here are some optical illusions you can create on your own. This is just a couple of drawings, but when I flip it, the lights change. This pencil's made out of wood, but I could make it look like rubber. I bet you think I'm making a knot. It looks like a knot, but it's not. I can make my thumb look like it's broken in two pieces. This optical illusion makes you think you're seeing purple, but you're really seeing red and blue. I can make this pencil look broken. All I need is this glass of water. It's an optical illusion. I can have two faces in one, a man with a beard, and just me. <laughs> Some optical illusions are quick and easy to make. Others require great skill and care. Here's an artist who puts tremendous effort into creating optical illusions. And when you look at his paintings, you'll see why. To fool you, he paints skies where there should be ceilings. And he paints windows with real scenes in them on the walls. He pays perfect attention to every detail, so his paintings look absolutely real. Just take a look at those cats tangled in yarn. They're drawn so lifelike, you expect them to jump down any minute and bat that ball of yarn around. This kind of painting is called trompe l'oeil which is French for trick the eye. Usually, the whole picture is an optical illusion. It is designed and drawn to make you believe that something, like this table with jewelry, is real, when actually, it's only a painting. One thing you can count on when you see Trump Loy is that something will surprise you. In this case, it's the blackbird perched outside the picture frame. Real as it looks, it's part of the painting. It's Trump Loy.
My name is Christian Thee. I'm a painter, and I paint Trompe l'oeil. To be able to paint Trompe l'oeil, you have to understand the way the eye works, how to make things look far away, how to make other things look very close to you. Let me show you an example. We're going to establish what we call an horizon line. That's where the land meets the sky when you look off in the distance. A vanishing point is where things disappear too in this drawing that we're going to do of railroad tracks. Here's a pair of railroad tracks that are going to diminish right into the horizon. The railroad ties up close are further apart. As they get closer to the horizon, getting further and further away from you, the tracks get closer together, the railroad ties get closer together. If we wanted to put telephone poles, we could put a telephone pole here, find out how it goes into the distance by attaching our vanishing points to the top and bottom of the telephone pole and then continue drawing telephone poles within those lines. And we have telephone poles that get smaller and smaller until finally they would disappear over the horizon. A bird on this telephone pole would be a tiny dot on this telephone pole thus creating the illusion of distance. What I like about Trompe l'oeil is that anything is possible. Today, what I want is a view out of a door. You're looking across a balcony to a park, and in that park is a carnival with a roller coaster, a Ferris wheel. I think that would be a fun painting to have. When I'm preparing a painting, I create a plan so that I know exactly what I'm going to do before I do it. The more precise you can be about your drawing, the more illusion you can create. The tools that I use are the pencil, the paintbrush, the straight edge, but I guess the most important tool of all is the imagination. I think with any talent, you fine tune it to the point where you can do exactly what you want with that paintbrush. The line, the shape, the sharp edge to an object is what basically fools the viewer and creates the illusion. Now that I'm close to finishing my carnival painting, uh, I decided I wanted to do something that would add some really special magic to the painting. So I decided to make the lights of the Ferris wheel and the lights of the roller coaster operate and all the other lights twinkling in the middle of a carnival. Trompe l'oeil is a kind of painting that causes you to want to look out the window that is painted pass through the door that has been created to the point where you want to touch it. And when I've succeeded, nothing pleases me more.
In Opt, there is a first-rate art gallery, and the great thing is, each picture is more than it seems. In this case, there are two pictures in one. In one picture, there is an old woman facing sideways. Here's her eye, nose, mouth, and chin. Got it? Okay. In the other picture, there's a young woman looking back. Here's her eye, cheek, chin, and necklace. You can't see both women at the same time, but switch your attention back and forth, and each will appear. Here's an illusion that really makes you see things. Where the white lines cross, gray spots appear. You see them? Okay. See these boxes? Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, and six. And if we turn them all upside down, there should still be six, right? <laughs> Wrong! Now, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It all depends on how you see it. <laughs> and you never know which way it will go in the land of art. <laughs> you can find optical illusions on television, in books, and in art. And you can also find them in nature. Animals use optical illusions like disguise and camouflage to hide from their enemies. Animals who blend in with their environment remain hidden until they move. Do you see the bird? Do you see the frog? From a distance, this white hair is invisible. And this owl looks exactly like the tree it lives in. Disguises work underwater, too. There is a flounder in this picture who perfectly matches the ocean floor. You can only see his eyes and gills move. And the flounder can change color if it swims to where the bottom looks different. Here's another camouflaged fish who looks just like the clumps of seaweed and sand that surround him. You only notice him when he moves. This horned lizard can barely be detected as it lunches on scurrying ants. The insect world is full of camouflage surprises. This walking stick looks just like a twig. Here's a leaf clipper you can't tell from the branch it's on. And doesn't this caterpillar look like tree bark? Here's one who anchors a silk thread to a tree to hold itself up in a branch-like position. Only because it's moving can you tell this insect from a leaf. Even this little thorn bug can be fooled by these caterpillars. It'll go all the way to the top without realizing it's on a fellow creature. <laughs> Until it's shaken off. This green insect looks like the serrated edges of the elm leaves it eats. In this picture, the insect resembles the dead brown edges of the hornbeam it munches. 
see it eating now? Here's a perfect example of how well camouflage can work. This hungry little bird doesn't realize that inches away under the branch, there's a full meal disguised to look like the branch itself. That's the beauty of camouflage. In this world of optical illusion and visual trickery, you might find yourself looking at everything twice. Well, here are some books that deserve more than one look, but you don't have to take my word for it. I'm Clexita Ortega, and I just found out how animals can trick your eyes in this book, Hide and Seek. For animals, fooling your eyes is serious business. It helps protect them from their enemies. Take a close look at this picture. You might be able to see an animal, or maybe not. Some spiders look just like flowers. This seaweed is really a fish. Are these thorns or bugs? They're bugs! Whenever you go outside, look carefully at the trees, the grass, and even the ground. You never know what might be hiding there. Here's a book that's really different. Get ready to look at the world from a caterpillar's point of view. In this book, If at First You Do Not See, it's about a little caterpillar who is tired of eating the same old food. His adventure starts when he looks for something different to eat. He makes a new discovery. Things are not always as they appear. For example, ice cream looks appealing. But wait! They are really two clowns, not somebody's dessert. Here's a nice white mushroom. But it turns into two ugly witches before his very eyes. I love everything about this story. It's fun. It might even make you laugh. I'm Nisa Fajardo. There are many more surprises waiting for you in this book. So why don't you check it out? Are you the kind of kid who likes modern science? Well, I've got a book that's a real eye-opener. It's called Lenses. I love this book. It's about lenses and the way you see. The test for colorblindness is really neat. Can you see the giraffe? How about the fish? My favorite part was the optical illusions. These pictures play tricks on your eyes. Like this picture of a vase. No, I mean two people. No, I mean a vase. I'm Graham Pierce, and if you like having fun with technology, you should take a closer look at this book, Lenses. You know, most of the time, your eyes don't deceive you. The world is a pretty reliable place. But keep your eyes open. Because every once in a while, an optical illusion just might play a trick on you. I'll see you next time.
Today's Reading Rainbow books are Opt, an Illusionary Tale by Arlene and Joseph Baum, published by Viking Penguin, a division of Penguin Books USA Incorporated. Lenses, Take a Closer Look by Siegfried Aust, illustrated by Helga Nenke, published by Lerner Publications Company. If at first you do not see by Ruth Brown, published by Henry Holt and Company, Incorporated. Hide and Seek, an Oxford Scientific Films book edited by Jennifer Caldry and Karen Goldie Morrison, published by G.P. Putnam Sons. Reading Rainbow is made possible by a grant from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the National Science Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, this station, and other public television stations, and by Dayton Hudson Corporation on behalf of Target, Mervyn's, Dayton Hudson Department Store Company, and Leachmere. Butterfly in the sky, I can go twice as high. Take a look, it's in a book, a reading rainbow. been telling me about an amazing store around here. They say there's nothing in the world like it. So I wanted to see for myself. Ah, this must be it. Hats to wear. Hats to wear. Strange name for a hat store. Well, come on, let's check it out. Wow, look at this. Every kind of hat you can imagine. Straw hats, top hats, cowboy hats, even books about hats. This is a great place. We're totally surrounded by hat after hat. Whoa! Did you see that? I think my eyes are playing tricks on me. Ooh, this store is definitely keeping some secrets. Okay, books are always good for finding answers. I wonder what kind of books are in a hat store. <laughs> the Great Hatsby, Pat the Beanie. Ah, this one looks promising. In fact, it's perfect. All about hats. It's called a three hat day. Bell, read by Zelda Rubenstein. R. R. Pottle the Third loved hats. He loved firemen's helmets and fur hats and felt hats with feathers tucked in the bands. He loved top hats and tiny hats. He loved berets and bonnets, and bathing caps, and bowlers. R. R. Poggle was the last of a long line of Poggles. Father collected canes. Mother liked umbrellas. Together they took long walks in the rain. After a happy life together, mother and father died. R.R. R. lived by himself in the Poggle Mansion. He was rather lonely. He dreamed of meeting his future wife in the rain, and he dreamed she would be wearing 
perfect hat. Every morning when R.R. woke, the first thing he did, before he polished his glasses, before he combed his mustache and his few strands of hair, even before he yawned, was choose a hat. Sometimes when he was feeling sad, he chose two and wore them, one on top of the other. One bright, clear morning, R.R. felt so sad, he wore three hats. He passed two frogs in a pond, singing a tender duet. R.R. recognized the tune. It was Estrellita Be Mine, the love song. Our, our shoulders drooped. There was only one thing left to do on such a glum day. With a sigh of relief, he glided through the revolving doors of the largest hat store in town. What hats! There were fezzes and face veils, tiaras and tam shanters There were sombreros and skull caps, pillboxes and panamas. There were beanies with propellers. There were derbies with green glitter that glowed in the dark. And much, much more. He tried on the sombrero and did a little jig. Pom-poms hit his nose. What are you doing? A sharp voice rang out. R.R. was doing a pirouette. An angry saleswoman pointed at him, scowling. Stop that, she said. R.R. took off the sombrero, slipped it back on the shelf, and backed away. Tears came to his eyes. He turned to leave. Just then, a round figure rushed out from behind a curtain. When she saw R.R., she smiled. It was the sweetest smile he had ever seen. And above the smile was a hat. A perfect hat. On one side, a seat when Seal balanced the shining ball on the tip of its nose. On the other, tiny gold bells jangled, and a plume as soft and gray as fog graced the peak. Oh, Isabel, the cross one said, that little man is messing up our hats. Look, he's wearing three. But Isabel was still smiling broadly at him. Why, Ida, she said, we don't sell sailor hats. She stepped up to R.R. and gently took off his sailor hat. And Ida, she said, we don't sell firemen's helmets. And gently she took off his helmet. And Ida, dear, we don't sell bathing caps either. And gently, gently, she took off R.R.'s bathing cap. It's clear, said Isabel, balancing on her toes, that this man is no messer-upper of hats. It's very clear, said she, that this man is a lover of hats. And she beamed. R.R. R. took off his glasses. Shall we go for a walk? Yes, said Isabel. They passed a pond where two frogs sat doing a duet. <laughs> Isabel recognized the tune. It was, Love, is that you? <laughs> Isabel and R.R. Poggle III lived ever after in the Poggle Mansion where R.R. Poggle IV was born. R.R. Poggle IV did not like hats. She did not like umbrellas. And pains left her cold. 
R R Paddle the Fourth loved shoes. R R Paddle would love this store and all the hats in it, even if there is something odd going on here. I mean. This looks like an ordinary pith helmet, the kind an explorer might wear. Uh, But, excuse me. That is exactly what I'm looking for. This pith helmet? Mm -hmm. But this is not the kind of hat that goes with a tuxedo. Ah, uh, but it's not what the hat goes with. It's where the hat goes. Whoa! Where the hat goes? Where the hat goes? Hats to wear! Well, let's see. Well, this looks like some sort of weird baseball cap. <sighs> okay, hat. Take me out to the ball game. Whoa, where am I? Hey. Hey, what are you doing? Uh, I, I don't know. Where, where am I? You're at Turf Paradise. This is a racetrack. I'm Denise McCormick, and I'm a jockey. So all these guys, we're going to go ride a race. What Hi, are you Denise. doing? I, I, well, I guess I'll ride the race with you. What do well, I, do I don't first? think you will like that. You better put your goggles down. Goggles? They're, they're up here, huh? Yeah, you're gonna be eating some dirt. You better buckle up your chin strap. Okay. Let's see. Oh, okay. Here we go. Then what? Okay, get your stick out. Here? Yeah. Uh-huh. This, this doesn't hurt a horse, does it? Oh, no, this is just to urge him on a little. Okie doke. Okay, get your reins. All One right. One in each hand. One in each hand. Grab the mane. Uh-huh. <laughs> And then what? And get tied on, big boy, because it'll get a little western. Okay. Good luck. A horse race. I can't believe it. It is now post time. Last horse in, Wally Sombrero with Lamar Burton, who's riding for the first time at Turf Paradise. They're all set to go. The flag is up. Outside, Wally Sombrero, followed by Skycap, Top Hat, and Fedora. Into the first turn and racing towards the back stretch. Blue Bonnet has the lead, Wally Sombrero to challenge. After that, it's Fedora, followed by Top Hat and Skycap. They race down the back stretch, tightly bunched towards the front end. On the inside, Wally Sombrero now takes the lead. With Blue Bonnet still in second, Fedora is third, then Top Hat and Skycap. Down the back stretch and racing around the far turn. Wally Sombrero opens up the lead by five for Lamar Burton. The field now enters the stretch. Wally Sombrero opening up the commanding lead. They're coming into the final yards of the race, Lamar Burton will win this with Wally Sombrero. Thank you very nice much. Ride. Oh, how about a kiss? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. You know, the horse did all the work, but I really owe a debt of gratitude to this hat that brought me here today. <clears throat> I get it. This place is not your ordinary neighborhood hat store. Let's try another one. Mmm, nah, too cold. Ah. A railroad cap. I'd love to ride a locomotive. Woo-hoo! All aboard! Tiny trains. Is this some sort of miniature world? Hi, LeVar. I'm Bruce Williams. Hey, where am I anyway? Well, you're in Three Bridges, New Jersey, home of one of the world's largest model railroads. Let me show you around. Great. So, Bruce, this is...
This is really remarkable. It really looks like you've created a whole miniature world here for these trains. Well, this is one of, of many, many, many towns. We have some cities and we have little towns like this. The attention to detail, though, is really, I think, the most fascinating thing. There are so many little touches, you know? Mm -hmm. Not just the people, but like signs on, on the houses. I see laundry hanging out of the window over there. Well, they get their clothes dirty in that house, too. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's remarkable. Well, see, when we're not here, and there's nobody down here, this community becomes alive. The little people walk around, smoke comes out of the chimneys. Really? <laughs> Bruce, how many guys does it take to run this train? Well, LeVar, would you believe it takes 81 men to run this system? 81? Yep. In fact, right around the corner over here, we've got a couple of the operators running some trains. And how big is the train set up altogether? Well, after this room, there's five more rooms just like it. Come on, let's go look at them. Could you tell me a little bit about the bridges? There's over 400 bridges, all of which are scratch built. So you've built every single one of these bridges by hand? Yep. You gotta know what you're doing to make it support the weight of the train. Some of these trains can weigh as much as 20, 30 pounds. Really? Yeah, you know, the engine and all the cars. This mm -hmm. is completely scratch built from nothing, just like this bridge is scratch built. Just so you started with just raw materials? Right. Cardstock, and um, built the railings, and, and designed this thing, and uh, Presto, we have a building, an industrial building. It's like a, a mining town or something, or, or what? This is uh, a mining refractory, and they go back into the mountains, way past this bridge, and they ore it out and bring it through the bridge, in through the building, down, it's crumbled up and put into other freight cars, and on it goes. On its merry way. On its merry way. How do you feel about this? I mean, you've obviously devoted a lot of time, 14 years of your life. I love it. I just thoroughly enjoy creating. It's a lot of hard work, uh, but I have these dreams and these pictures in my mind that I want to create and, uh, you know, find what the heart can do and then do it with all your might. LeVar, great having you here. I gotta go build a bridge. I gotta scoop. Thanks, Bruce, so much for showing me around. Terrific. Wow. Oh, wait a minute. I... Oh, how do I get back where I came from? Think, LeVar, think. Ah, I think it has something to do with this hat. Whoa. Ah, I get it. I just took this off and said hat. And I'm back. Hmm. These hats can take you anywhere you want to go. And I know something else that can do that. A good book. So here are three that'll flip your lid. But you don't have to take my word for it. Some people like hats. Some people like gloves. But the person who wrote this book likes shoes. All kinds of shoes. And guess what the name of the book is? Shoes. This book is a poem, all about things to wear on your feet. There are shoes to slide in and run in, shoes to turn a double flip in, shoes for fishing, and rubber shoes for muddy squishing, and lots and lots more. You'll love this book, or my name is Jarrah Witt. So put on your favorite shoes and run right down to the library right now. <laughs> Caps for sale! Caps for sale! That's the name of the book that I just read. Hi, my name is Vincent Sierra, and this book is terrific. It's about a man who sells caps and carries them on his head. He's a funny little guy. He walks around town slowly so they don't fall off his head. One morning, he can't sell any of his caps. So he decides to take a nap alongside a great big tree. When he wakes up, the caps are gone. There's some mysterious monkey business in this story. And the pictures are marvelous. I like this book because it teaches you not to fall asleep on the job. So put on your cap and pick it up at your local library. 
Hi, are you interested in meeting some very unusual characters? Well, there's a couple in this book. It's called Mabel's Suitcase. Mabel is a 108-year-old woman. And Binkle is a bird who lives next door. Mabel is famous for making unusual hats. Some of them are a little weird. Mabel and Binkle work together on a terrific hat for the annual hat making contest. I'm Michelle Bernstein, and if you like funny stories as much as I do, you should read Maybelle's Suitcase. Now, here's my entry for the annual hat contest. What do you think? Okay, I think we should try one more of these hat trips. Let's see what we've got here. Huh. A trip on the ocean? Nah, too far away. Hmm. Definitely too far away. Huh. What's this? I've never seen a hat like this before. I wonder what it's for. Maybe some sort of two-sided helmet. Can you guess? I don't have a clue. Well, I guess there's only one way to find out. I hope I don't regret this. Hey, LeVar, your helmet's on backwards. What? Oh, but at least you have your skates on properly. Skates? Skates! Oh, oh! Hey, let me give you a hand there. Let me get you up. There we go. Thanks. There you are. Hey, where am I anyway? We're at the Nassau Coliseum. You're a practice for the New York Islanders. Ah. Come on, let's show you. Take it easy there. <laughs> How are you doing now? Well, I'm a little shaky, but I think we'll be okay. <laughs> okay, LeVar, I'm Kelly Rudy, the New York Islanders. I'm one of the goaltenders. How are you doing? I'm all right, Kelly. How are you? Good, good. Let me show you a little bit about the stuff that we're wearing today. Uh-huh. Uh, first, we have the skates down there, then the pads, pants, chest and arm protectors. Right. Then we have the gloves. This is a blocker. Uh-huh. That's really not for catching anything. As you see, there's no pocket or anything. You really just sort of knock the pucks out of harm's just way. Whack it away. Exactly, huh? exactly. Okay. Next, then we have the catching glove. Mm. It yeah. looks exactly like a catcher's mitt. Exactly, no different. Uh -huh. Then we have the stick. This is really just for deflecting the shots away. Uh -huh. Then we have the helmet here. You had it on like this. Ah. That's not correct. Face it with the cage facing forward. The bars go outside this way, huh? Exactly. There's another thing I want to tell you about is the balance, and that's really the most important thing about goaltending. Why don't you just stand over here, okay. and I'll show you a few things. Right here, huh? Exactly. Okay. First off, you want to really bend your legs. You want to keep the, the weight on the balls of your feet facing forward, stick out in front of you with a firm grip. Ready to make a few saves? Sure. <laughs> Try it? Okay. Okay, the first one will be a leg save, okay? We'll uh -huh. just stick out the left leg. <laughs> out like that and bring it right on up. Can you try that? Just stick out the left exactly. leg. Exactly. Keep the legs bent properly. Ah, there you go. That's all right. Yeah. Add yeah. a little speed to it. Try uh -huh. it the other way now. Try it the other way. Okay. Just like that. Like that. Uh -huh. Bring it back up. Uh -huh. Then once you do it a few times, you can get a little quicker here. <laughs> Why don't, I don't you think, try that? I don't think I'll get it that quick. Like that, huh? There you go. And like that. Huh? Exactly. How's that? Now stand right back up. Want to try some glove saves now? Okay, a glove save. Okay. First, you'll envision that a puck's coming towards you. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is turn your body and pretend that you're going to grab it with your glove. Boom. Like that. Exactly. Yeah, just, just like a catching glove. Just like in baseball. Exactly. Okay. You want to try everything a little quicker now? Okay. Okay. Left leg. Left leg. Up. Uh-huh. Right leg. Right. Up. Up. Glove save. Glove save. Other gloves. Other gloves. Save. Great. How's that feel? Yeah, that feels pretty good. <laughs> want to give it a try? You think I'm ready? I think you're ready. Okay. Pull it, you guys. Take it easy on them. Let them feel the puck. Keep my balance here. Exactly. Glove out. Oh. the puck. What a save. Oh, yeah. Great stop. Got to get down here. Doing good. Oh, okay. great job. All right. Way to clear that rebound. Oh, yeah. Great job, great catch. Now, what do you do with it when you catch it? <laughs> Just hang on to it. Hang on to face it. Face off. Okay. Hey. Oh yeah. All right. You want to keep your gloves up here so you don't get them too much of the top part of the net. Just like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Right. 
Oh, there got go. by me there. Got by me. All right, here we go. Here we go. Oh, yeah, concentrating, having fun up there. Well, now, this looks pretty easy. In fact, it's a piece of cake. Oh, come on. Why don't you put your helmet on, then we'll take some real shots at you. All righty. All right. There Just you go. Like this, huh? Exactly. Okay. Put the glove back on. Uh-huh. We'll shoot some real hard ones out. Uh -huh. How's that sound? All right. If, you're, if you think you're so good. Well, we'll <laughs> give it a shot. Ready, Ready Great hat trick. Whew. Anyway, three hats will do it for me today. Hey, I guess we did have a three hat day, right? So, I'll see you. Whoa, wait a minute. Look at this. Nah, I think this would just better stay a three hat day. Okay, I'll see you next. Oh, what the heck? Let's make it a four-hat day. <laughs> I'll see you next time. Whoa! Butterfly in the sky I can go twice as high Take a look It's in a book A reading rainbow I can go anywhere Friends to know And ways to grow A reading rainbow Butterfly in the sky, I can go twice as high. Take a look, it's in a book, a reading rainbow. I can be anything. Take a look, it's in a book, a reading rainbow. Today's Reading Rainbow books are A Three Hat Day by Laura Geringer. Pictures by Arnold Lobel, published by Harper and Row. Shoes by Elizabeth Winthrop, illustrated by William Joyce, published by Harper and Row. Caps for Sale by Esper Slobodkina, published by Harper and Row. Maybell Suitcase by Tricia Tusa. Published by Macmillan Publishing Company. million years, this creature and its relatives ruled the Earth. What secrets lie hidden in their bones? Well, coming up next on Newton's Apple, we'll piece together the story of the dinosaur. Also, bulletproof vests, how a fabric can save lives. All this and more next on Newton's Apple. Welcome to Newton's Apple. Newton's Apple is made possible by a grant from DuPont, makers of better things for better living. 
and also by this station and other public television stations. And now your host, science correspondent, Ira Clayton. Thank you. Welcome again to Newton's Apple. Do you wonder about nature, marvel at technology or the human body? Are you just curious about the world around you? Well, then you've come to the right place because we're here to answer your questions. So, let's go right to our first question. Hi, my name is Lynn Rubright, and I watch Newton's Apple in St. Louis on KETC. And I am fascinated by the big skeletons of dinosaurs I see in museums. And I've been wondering, how do scientists begin their study when all they have to begin with are the bones? That's a thoughtful question. And here to answer that question is Rob Long of the University of California at Berkeley. Rob, how do you begin to study a dinosaur? Well, we were able to catch this dinosaur. <laughs> you didn't catch this dinosaur. Look at this. <laughs> this is not real, is it? No. <laughs> oh, look, it's moving and everything. What kind of dinosaur does this represent? This is Triceratops, and it's only one half size. Triceratops. It lived about 65 million years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, what can you tell about this dinosaur and other dinosaurs by their bones. You must be able to tell an awful lot, right? Well, we have not only their bones, we have their footprints, and we have eggs and nests. So we have a lot to work on. Mm -hmm. uh, on this dinosaur, for example, we have evidence of great herds of these living in Montana and Wyoming during no the, the, the end of the age of dinosaurs. Because you find the bones there. Right. Great numbers of bones, thousands of bones. Uh, we think he probably lived in herds. Mm -hmm. And also his crest oftentimes has uh, gashes, pits, indicating that these things fought and with, and mm -hmm. with their horns. Now, can you tell us about what he ate? I mean, how do you study that? Well, we study his teeth, and he has oh, very strong sense. teeth. Uh, but he, the, there are the teeth of a plant eater, so he probably ate, well, palm leaves, mm. uh, which were very common at that time. Let's talk about dinosaurs in general. Where would you find them living? I mean, Triceratops and the other dinosaurs. Well, see, they lived for about a period of 150 million years, and they lived everywhere. Huh. We find them on all continents. It was a very warm, subtropical co climate, very kind to the dinosaurs. They thrived. They did, and they were very successful for oh. 150 million years. What? Humans oh. have been around for a few million. <laughs> yeah. So even though they died out, they really were. They knew oh. what they were doing all right. And we know of at least 150 different kinds. Big ones and small ones? And yeah, chicken-sized ones up to giants, as, you know, as big as 10, 15 elephants. Mm. Ooh. Well, if the bones tell you... The, the general structure of the dinosaur, how do you know what the outsides of them look like? How do you know what, how the skin looked, the color, the texture, things like that? Well, we have skin impressions. Of all and, the dinosaurs? Well, no, just of a few of them. But uh, when some of these dinosaurs died on mud flats, they actually left scale impressions really? in the mud, and we have been able to restore the uh, skin. And if you don't find skin impressions of dinosaurs, how do you figure out what the outside looks like? Well, oftentimes you compare it to uh, living reptiles and uh, for coloration. And, or alligators and, such. and things yeah, like that? Yeah, right. All right, but let's say you do find bones. What do you do to put it together to create a, a magnificent dinosaur? All right, like let's this? start with the bones. Come over here. I want okay. to show you this. Boy, have you got a bone to pick with me? <laughs> Actually, this is a juvenile dinosaur. This is a, a brontosaur thigh bone. A brontosaur, that's that big dinosaur with the, the giant neck and the head right, that used to come right. down in the swamp. And a full adult would have a femur that high. Hmm. Well, wait a minute, let me stop you first, because you immediately recognize this as a brontosaur bone. How do you know? That's all part of the game, I see. How do you know that this is a brontosaur bone? A lot of digging. Over the last hundred <laughs> years, a number of skeletons have been found, and they have been found with their limb bones. So we take an isolated bone like this and compare them to the limb bones from full skeletons. Well, let's say I was digging my garden, right. okay? And I found one of these bones lying down there, and uh -huh. I, I know my dog didn't bury it, <laughs> right? I bring it to you. How do you tell, without seeing it among other bones, what kind of well, you're gonna hate bones. me for this, but I break it. <laughs> yeah, I try not to break it in too many pieces. Uh, brontosaur bones are solid, mm -hmm. uh, whereas all other dinosaur bones were hollow. Oh, no because kidding. these are monsters. They they got up to you know 50 tons, mm. so they need massive bones. Getting back to the isolated bone, we can tell that it was four-legged animal. Hell. You see this bulge right here? Mm -hmm. That's where a muscle fit on, and. We know by dissecting chicks, of all things. Chickens? Chickens. You, wait a minute, wait, right. a minute, wait a minute. You, tell about, you can tell about a dinosaur bone by dissecting chickens? Right. Why right. chickens? Well, chickens are, of course, birds, and birds are very close to the ancestry of dinosaurs, and chickens are easy to get. Oh. And, but in dissecting chickens, which we know walked on their hind legs, right. this bulge was much higher up. It gave, gave more swing into the femur. When, when, you get, when you get this 
bulge down here near the midsection, it indicates a much more ponderous animal and one that walked on all fours. You really have to be Sherlock Holmes to understand uh -huh. how this works. Well, of course, if you find more bones together in one spot, then it's easier to put a skeleton together. Right? Oh, yes, yes. And, but we have made some mistakes. But look, come over here. I want to show you these. Now, here are a couple of tail vertebrae of a brontosaur, and they were found together. They fit very nicely. Right. And when scientists find them together, like, there seems to be no problem as no. far as figuring out what the dinosaur looked like. I can understand when they're all lined up in a row, you should have no problem. Right. But the head end has presented some problems. <laughs> the head end of this dinosaur? Right. Right. About 70 years ago, there was a skeleton found, yeah. and beautiful. All the bones were together, but the head was about 12 feet away. So? So, they, oh. naturally, they put it on the, uh, the end of the uh, neck, and they mounted it. No problem. Right. And all the other museums that had headless brontosaurs... Uh, did the same did thing. The, yes. They made their own heads and right. mounted them up there? Right. In 1979, they realized it was the wrong head. <laughs> it was the wrong head. Right. And they went over and they changed all of the skeletons. You, you mean all those years when I was a kid, I was going to the right. museum? Right. It was the wrong head right. on the brontosaurus. Wrong guy entirely. <laughs> well, I'm glad they went about and changed it. Right. Well, then I guess for a, a scientist, the best of all worlds is to find a skeleton totally intact. Oh. It sounds like a rare event. It so. is a very rare event. But let me show you this guy. Now, here is a small duckbill dinosaur, actually probably a baby. Mm -hmm. And there were about five of them found together, and they were found in a nest with eggs. Okay. And uh, a much larger uh, individual of the same species was found very close to it. It was probably one of the parents. No, it's the parents. Right. And so we have, for the first time, what looks like a family nursery. And you really never knew or could prove that dinosaurs lived in family units like that? Well, we that. found eggs and we found some bones of little animals, but we never found them all together. That is truly amazing. Let me point out something that looks uh, fascinating here is that the head on this dinosaur looks so much bigger in relationship to the body than the heads on the other dinosaurs that we've seen. Does that mean it's got a much bigger brain in there? Well, it's, it's a, it, it has a fairly big brain, mm -hmm. but there are much larger brain dinosaurs. Let me show you the Einstein of dinosaurs. <laughs> the Einstein of dinosaurs. All right. Look at the eyes on this dinosaur. They really are spooky looking. Now, he, you say he's the Einstein. What do you mean the Einstein of dinosaurs? He has a whopping big brain. Really? He only weighs about 100 pounds, but his brain is larger than that of, say, a brontosaur, which weighed, of course, many tons. No kidding. Well, what does a brain this size do for a dinosaur like this? It allows him to be a very keen hunter. What do you mean by that? Well, it would coordinate a whole series of activities. Uh, he has those huge eyes, and you notice they're directed straight forward. That's yeah. different than the other dinosaurs. Right. He has binocular vision, like we do, so mm -hmm. we can center in. He can focus in on animals. Mm -hmm. That helps when you're oh, hunting. Right. When he's, when he, and you notice how big his hands are, yes. and his thumbs are opposable, like our thumbs. This animal might have gone after mammals. So he can grasp right. what he's going so after then. He'll huh? just grab now, and he has them. But look at those feet. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's equipped with everything. Huge <laughs> claws on, on his feet. Yes. And this is probably for kicking a uh, much larger prey and just ripping out the stomach. Mm -hmm. So he really is built for hunting and, and far more advanced than the other dinosaurs. Well, let's say he's a far more talented dinosaur. <laughs> but unfortunately for this dinosaur and the rest of the dinosaurs, they all died out, what, 65 million right, years ago? Right, And the $64 question is, what happened to the dinosaurs? There Why? Are all kinds of theories. There are probably over 100 theories. Okay. And some of the most popular ones are the asteroid theory a tremendous asteroid hitting the earth mm. and causing the extinction. There's also uh, the, the climate changing, it becoming colder, and the mammals taking over. Uh, so th you have a great number of theories, and one theory doesn't seem to explain it all. So right. maybe it was a whole combination of theories, mm. or maybe none of them fit, and maybe we'll never know. Ooh, that's, a, that's an interesting thought to end on. Thank you, Rob, for picking through the bones of the dinosaurs with us. We'll have more in a minute. down the shore hairs onto the skin. Because of its dark color, the skin absorbs the light and helps the bear keep warm during the winter.
That explosion was a 357 Magnum bullet fired through this stack of wooden boards, and it went through about nine boards before it finally stopped. And as you can see, a bullet from almost any kind of firearm has an incredible amount of impact power, power that most of us have little feeling for until, until you see something like this. And we created this demonstration to answer a question sent in by Randy Bradshaw of Avon, Ohio, who writes, how do bulletproof vests and bulletproof windows stop a bullet? Here to provide the answers is Lou Miner, engineer from the DuPont Research Labs in Wilmington, Delaware. Welcome to the program, Lou. It's a pleasure to be here. Robert. That was a powerful demonstration. How is it possible that bulletproof vests can stop a bullet like that? Well, first off, let me correct you on one term. There's no such material that's bulletproof. Ooh. The proper term is bullet resistant. There's always a bullet that'll go through a vest like that's this. That's right. Now, uh, here is a bullet resistant vest. Notice how light it is. It's very, very light. There must be a secret to the fabric that does something here. Yes, isn't it incredible? Let me show you the, the material that's the real key to this. This, li this, this, real, this fabric? Yeah. Yes, look how yeah. thin it is and feels very light. How right. does it work? Okay, the key to it is the, uh, the aramid fiber that is woven into the fabric. This is aramid fiber. That's a, a special kind of fiber. It's not like my sweater made out of wool or anything like no, that. No, that's right. It's a very strong specialty fiber. Uh, when the bullet first encounters this fabric, mm -hmm. the, uh, just a few fibers are uh, encountered by the bullet, and they spread the energy outward. And soon, the fibers, all the fibers in the fabric are, are sharing this, this energy. Oh, I see. By spreading it out in a larger area, you've deadened the impact on one little spot. You've lessened it. But how, how is the fiber is able to absorb it before the bullet goes through it? Well, the fiber is so strong that it can deform before it breaks. I see. That's very, very interesting. Yeah, there's another way to show this by this trampoline over here. You want me to get on this? Yes, why don't you get on there and bounce up and down? I'll make believe I'm a bullet hitting the fiber then. Okay. Okay. Now, notice that three things are happening. Number one, the trampoline is deforming downward. Mm -hmm. Secondly, energy is transmitted along the plane of the trampoline. And the, the third thing that's happening is that you're responding elastically by bouncing up and down. I'm also bending my knees. Uh, I'm really getting a push from this, but... The bullet doesn't really, you know, move like I am. It's not elastic, is it? Now, remember, the bullet is lead and will deform. Oh, so whereas it's going to crush us. That's yeah. right, whereas you can respond by, bend, by bending your knees. Now, we've placed some aramid fabric for a demonstration. So oh, we're going to shoot at that one now? Yes, if you'll okay. come over here. Now, are we going to fire the same bullet we fired at the wood into the fabric? That's right. Uh, Bruce Wojak, who is a uh, uh, firearms instructor, has loaded a 357 Magnum jacketed soft point bullet. Mm -hmm. It looks like he has a very special firing mechanism there. It doesn't at all look like a handgun. That's, that's right. This is a laboratory device that we've set up for this demonstration. So we just people at home shouldn't think they can do this at home very safely. We don't want them to try it. Absolutely not. And notice that we're standing behind a plastic screen to protect right. us in right. case there's any ricochet. Okay. Okay, we're ready to go. If you can put on your ear protectors. You ready, Ira? I'm ready. Okay, here we go. Whoa. Okay, let's get these ear protectors off and take a look at what happened. Look at that. It really did make a, at least it went through the first part of the... Yes, well, you know, there's an awful lot of energy involved. That bullet was traveling well above the speed of sound. Hmm. You get these straps the off. Ooh, look at that. It, it did not go through the aramid. That's right. The aramid captured the bullet. But it made it... Look at that depression it made in the clay. What would that do to somebody who was wearing this? Oh, that would cause a, a severe bruise and, and some lacerations. It's like being hit very hard with a hammer. But at least you'd still be alive, right? That's right. That's the important thing. Mm. Now, I brought along some slides to show you. These are uh, high-speed photos of a similar experiment. Here comes the bullet approaching the fabric. Look at the shadow of the bullet mm. on the fabric. Yes. Now it just encounters a few yarns, and there's the that, wave. That diamond-shaped pattern, what is that? That's right. That's a stress wave traveling at the speed of sound, and now the bullet bounces off like your trampoline. <laughs> Actually bounced right off the fabric. Yeah. Now what about bulletproof glass? Does bulletproof glass work the same way? In a similar fashion, but remember the key word is bullet resistant. Bullet resistant. Let me show you over here. This is a piece of very tough plastic that has been laminated together. So it's not glass at all, then? No, no, glass would be far too brittle. It would shatter. And when you say laminated, I can count one, two, three, four layers. That's of right, and it's put together with a very elastic adhesive. Now, we've set up another demonstration with this material. If you'll come on over here, we're, we're almost ready to fire. 
Bruce has loaded a bullet. Let's get behind our protective shield and put the ear protectors back on. So now we're looking through the plastic straight into the barrel of the gun. That's right. Wow. Oh, let's take a look at that one. Look at that hole. It's just like a crater on the moon. Yeah. Look at the way the bullet's deformed. Mm -hmm. Notice the bullet has in intruded and then energy has been absorbed outward. Look, mm -hmm. at, look at that energy ring. That, that energy ring, is that what has actually spread out and dissipated the energy? Yes, and maybe we can see it more clearly in this block that we shot earlier. Okay, here, oh yes, it's very clear. In fact, there appears to be more than one ring. There are at least two or three rings going around in the circle there. That's right. And notice also that there's a deformation inward by the bullet. Look at that mm. bump on the back of the block. Around. Oh yes, look at that. That's very much the way the aramid fabric uh, behaved when it hit the clay. Are there bullets that will not be stopped by this, that will just go right through it? Oh yes, and there's also bullets that will ricochet off. But keep in mind that this plastic material and the aramid fabric that we saw earlier can and have saved a number mm. of lives. Well, thank you very, very much for coming and for giving us a high-caliber demonstration today. We'll have more in a minute. Back in the audience now for our next question. And this time it comes from... John Pinatello. John, you had an interesting question. Share it with us, please. Yes. Um, what is heartburn? And is it my heart that's really burning? <laughs> Get heartburn often, do you? <laughs> <laughs> interesting question. And here to answer it is Dr. Jan Siri, biologist from McAllister College. Welcome again, Jan. Thanks, Ira. I see you have Ernie with you. Yeah, I came along. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get right to the question. What is heartburn, and what really is going on? Well, it isn't your heart that's burning. <laughs> it's your esophagus that's mm. burning. And your esophagus is by your heart, so you may think it's your heart, but I it see. isn't. Um, Ernie brought his esophagus with him tonight. Good to see that. This is his esophagus. This is the food tube that uh, takes the food down to the stomach. This is his stomach, and this is his small intestine. Now, we've lowered the stomach and made it a little larger so you can see what's going on. Mm. Mm -hmm. The stomach secretes acid, hydrochloric acid, and that's probably to kill bacteria in your food, but it's a sort of a hostile environment. Um, the stomach protects itself from the acid by secreting mucus. But um, normally, the stomach contents stay in the stomach, but sometimes they can regurgitate a little bit back up into the esophagus. Now, the esophagus isn't protected from that stomach acid, and then that causes pain, and it hurts, mm. and it's that that's, sensation that's of heartburn. heartburn. Yeah, mm, exactly. Yes. Now, to demonstrate to you exactly what happens, uh, or sort of close to what happens, <laughs> in heartburn. I'd like you to take one of these eggs and crack it into that beaker. All right. Okay, now... Making an omelet here, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> what's okay, going on? Now, what's in the beaker is acid, and the acid is about 100 times stronger than what's in the stomach, and that's just to speed the process. But this happens in the um, stomach as well. Now, the, the, the egg white is turning white. Exactly. It's the cells of your esophagus are made out of the same things as these eggs are, and that. when they're exposed to acid, they start to coagulate. Mm -hmm. You can see it's almost as if this egg is cooking. Yes, Okay. Yes. That's the damage that gets done when acid is exposed to living cells. Uh -huh. Now, what kinds of foods cause this kind of reflux back up into the... Well, anything that causes the stomach to secrete more acid, like spices, mm -hmm. okay, will do it. Or some, kind, some foods relax that valve, and that's uh, fatty foods, chocolate, uh, mm -hmm. nicotine has that effect, From too. From smoking? Yeah, right. I, is there anything you can do about it? I mean, take well, antacids? you can take like antacids. That helps reduce the acid content, and also drinking fluids when you eat. It helps wash the yeah. acid back down into the stomach. Well, thank you very much, Jan. Uh, Ernie, welcome. I hope you feel better next time you're here. <laughs> <laughs> now for our journey back in time. Selected short subjects in science and technology that some people would like to forget. As if those hot summer nights aren't restless enough, Junior is getting his teeth. And when Junior is unhappy, everyone in the house hears about it. But here is one mom who isn't going to lose any sleep. At the flick of the switch, it's rock -a bye baby in Junior's room. The baby rocker is powered by a motor attached to the legs of Junior's cradle. But will that gentle rolling motion soothe Junior and send him back to sleep? Well, he stopped crying, and that's half the battle. And back in her own bed, Mom can roll over and rest easy 
knowing that all is well. British, it seems, have their parking troubles, too. At any rate, an Englishman has figured out this ingenious method for getting that car out of the way. It's all very simple. You do the whole thing by pressing buttons. So far, it's only gotten to the model stage, but it's a nice idea. In the U.S., whose problem is a little more pressing, the same general idea is in actual operation. The car elevator can really handle cars, but quickly, as you'll see right now. No traffic congestion here, and it's a whole lot better than getting a ticket. We've come outside to meet our next guest. We're here at SeaWorld in Orlando, Florida, and surrounded by water, because that's where our next guests live. <laughs> the killer whales. <laughs> I'm with Thad Lucidic, who's head of supervisor of animal training here. Welcome, Thad. What are their names? This is Shamu and Namu, both Shamu killer whales. Killer. Well, they're mm -hmm. beautiful animals. How big are they? Well, they weigh about 5,000 pounds, and they're about 15 feet, 16 feet long right now. Now, when they're fully grown, they can get up to about 14,000 pounds and, and be about uh, uh, 30 feet long. Hmm, why are they called killer whales? I mean, they certainly don't look ferocious up here. Well, it's a name that was given to them by the sailors years ago. They called them whale killers because they observed them killing other whales in the wild. And the reason, <laughs> main reason they got that name is because they are the top predator in the ocean. They eat just about anything they want to. And no one eats them, huh? And nobody eats them. The old joke, what does a killer whale eat? Anything it was. <laughs> That's it. They eat anything from fish all the way up to blue whales. They eat a lot of different animals that are even on land, such as polar bears. They'll break through ice flows and grab okay. polar bears or slide up on beachheads and grab walrus or sea lions. Is that why they have the big teeth that they have? Well, that's one of the reasons okay. why they have those teeth, yeah. They use their teeth to grab their prey with. They huh. have 44 conically shaped teeth. They all fit like this so that when they bite something, they actually scissors it right off. Mm -hmm. um, and they just swallow the chunks whole. But they look like, like such gentle animals. I mean, you wouldn't think that they're killer whales, you know? They well, they are they gentle. They don't attack people, do No, they? no, they, they don't attack people. There are few, very few incidents of a killer whale ever attacking a man. And we believe that the times that it has happened, which has been a few times, have been caused because the animals mistook them for something else, a sea lion or a walrus. It's usually happened to surfers with wetsuits on. And as soon as they grabbed a hold of them, they let them go. And where do they come from? Well, killer whales are found in all oceans, and they travel in groups of anywhere from 10 to 50 animals. What do you call that group? Is that a herd? It's or? called a pod. A pod. Well, here at SeaWorld, they go through behaviors. They go swimming, and they go jumping up in the air, and... Uh, do all kinds of wonderful acrobatic tricks and actually come out on this. Is this a natural behavior coming up? We call up them like behaviors, you? not tricks. <laughs> <laughs> but right. it is a very natural behavior. This is one of them called mm -hmm. a slide out, where they actually slide up onto beachheads or ice flows and grab their prey. That's mm -hmm. one of the reasons they do that. Mm -hmm. They also like to play up here a lot. They push each other around in the slide out and push each other back. We're going to show you another one right now. I'm going to send Shamu back over to Chuck. He's going to send him all on a very natural behavior that we do also. What's this called? It's called bows. Okay. And, uh, let's, let's turn around and watch what he's doing here. Okay. Whoa, that was beautiful. <laughs> They can reach speeds of 35 miles an hour in the ocean. They look like they can maneuver them. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, they like to jump up here. <laughs> well, they almost look like they were playing around with you when they came up here and jumped on top of you. You know, I noticed you didn't give them any reward. You didn't give them a bunch well, of fish when they came up. That's back what I'm doing here. right now. This, is what, them on yeah, this is what they like more than anything. We use this whistle right here to tell them that they did the behavior correctly, and then we give them different types of rewards that they enjoy. This particular whale really likes to have his tongue shook. Why don't really? you go ahead and shake, his, shake tongue? his tongue? That's it. There you go. You like that, don't you? 
You like that? Yeah, <laughs> I know you do. Now, you mean, uh, you say this whale likes to have his tongue shake. Does this whale over here also like to have Not quite as much. Namu doesn't like it quite as much, but Namu really likes to have his belly button shaken. Why don't you guys come over here? That's it. You come over here now, and I'll you rub you down. You have to know which animal likes to have what done to him? Well, you have to, because that's a come very important part of how we train the whales. Why don't you come on up here again? <laughs> Attaboy. So you really have to be then a whale psychologist. You have to know what they want and their individual needs, and, and it's important to have this contact with them. It's very important. It takes us anywhere from three to five years to build a relationship with killer whales, to get to know them well enough to allow them to do the types of things that we do with them, getting in the water. And they really enjoy this physical contact that we have with them and all the different types of things that we can do for them. Um, they get all the food they want every day. Like I said, they get anywhere from 150 to 200 pounds a day. And uh, we use all these different types of rewards. You know, they really like to have you crawl on top of their backs, scratch them <laughs> down. <laughs> As you can see, they enjoy this a lot. You go ahead and scratch that one down. I'll scratch this one. Well, I mean, this is the closest I've ever gotten to a killer whale, and I'm not afraid of them one bit. There really is no problem with them. Thank you, Thad. Sure. For uh, taking uh, the demythologizing on, killer, killer whales for us. Hi. I'm Mark Smith from Cambridge, Massachusetts. I watch Newton's Apple on WGBH Boston. I'd like to know what comets are made of and whether they could hit the Earth. Are they dangerous? A good question, because it may sound hard to believe, but this gas mask is of the kind that was worn by people in 1910. They bought them to protect themselves from Halley's Comet. They actually thought that the comet would envelop the Earth in poisonous gas. Now, we get lots of questions about comets sparked by the return of the most famous of them all, Halley's. So, here to separate the fact from the fiction is Dr. Harry Shipman, an astronomer from the University of Delaware. Welcome to the program, Dr. Shipman. Glad to be here, Ira. Do we really need a mask like this when we look at comets? No, you don't have to worry about comets. <laughs> Let's, get not gonna hurt you. Let's get rid of that. What is then inside of a comet? The guts of a comet is a dirty snowball. How dirty is it, as they say? Real dirty. Let's make one. <laughs> all right. What have we got? All the ingredients for We've a comet? We've got all here? the ingredients, and I've got a recipe card right here. We start out with a couple pounds of ice, which is there in that bowl. Just Plain like old you... ice in the bowl. And then we add some dry ice to it. We dry know ice? there's carbon monoxide in comets. Mm -hmm. and and that presumably comes from dry ice, which is frozen carbon dioxide. We've got mm -hmm. a bunch of other stuff here that we can add to it a little nice bit Nice amount later. of dry ice. Nice amount of dry ice. Then we want to add a quarter of a cup of motor oil. Motor oil in a comet? Well, we're not talking about dead dinosaurs <laughs> up there in comets. Was this 10W30? <laughs> but they do, they do contain a certain amount of organic matter. Right. And the okay. organic matter, the best we can do is to bring in some motor oil. They also got some dust in them, so we got some good old There's black dirt. Dirt. And we got some sand. Some sand. Throw that around. And throw that around. We're Ooh. almost there. Oh, it looks like a vapor. It looks like the tail of the comet forming here. That's exactly what happens. That when something like dry ice comes in close to the sun, it heats up and it starts to evaporate. But we got a few more things we got to add to that tail. We see some metals in it. Gross. So we've got to add some nickel. nickel. All right. And we got to add some iron. Firelings go in there. What a recipe. And then we've got a little bit more organic spice to add. We've got some graphite. We've got some asphalt. Wait a minute. Asphalt in space? Well, we're not talking about highways to heaven. This is just more <laughs> organic material. Okay. And then we've got a little bit of mixed minerals to take into account. Does that do it? Stuff. That does it. And then we mix gotta it up. Mix it up real well. Get our dirty snowball, huh? That's right. This is really. Now, where would a dirty snowball like this reside in outer space? Where would it come from? Well, we find a lot of these things that are out in what's called a comet cloud. It's about a quarter of the way to the nearest star. Mm -hmm. And then every once in a while, a passing star will give one of these snowballs a nice little nudge and send it hurtling into the inner part of the solar system, where then it comes uh, closer to the sun. The sun will heat it up, and oh. it'll start boiling off all sorts of carbon dioxide and dirt and all that kind of thing. Well, there it is, the dirt part, uh, but the, I don't see the famous tail that we always see on a comet. How does the tail get formed on the comet? Well, when it comes inside the solar system, all this gas is produced, but to see the tail, we've got to take a look at a model of the solar system. All right, let's go. Works. Aha, uh -huh. I see your model. Sun, Earth. Sun, Earth, comet out there. And behind me is a picture of the comet. Ooh, that, which comet is that? It's a beautiful comet. This is Comet West, probably one of the best comets to appear in the 1970s. Now, which part of the comet is our dirty snowball? A dirty snowball is found right up there, On the right head. in the head. So small, you couldn't even see it in a picture like this. Now, you get the impression from looking at this comet picture that the comet is just going to streak across the sky like a meteorite, like a shooting star. And if you look for it, it's going to be... 
and gone forever. That's no, not how it works, right? No, a comet just sits there in the sky the same way the moon does, or a planet. The Chinese call them broom stars. But it is moving slowly. It just it, looks at, at that time like it's staying in one that's place. That's right. It does move slowly through the solar system. And let's take a look at this model and give you a bit of an idea of how it moves. All right, a comet started way out there. This could take years, this journey around It could here. take years for Halley's. It's 76 years. And we bring it in. And let's stop it right around here so you can see oh, what's happening. That's the tail. Point. That's the tail. And now the solar wind flow of high-speed particles that flow away from the sun is pushing this tail out away from the comet. I see, and that's what's creating the tail. And as we bring it around toward the front of the sun here, at least get it this far and stop it. At this point, what, the tail is leading the comet? It's not the tail behind. is leading the comet because the tail has to point away from the sun. And when the comet's moving away from the sun, the tail is pointing in the same way the comet's moving. Mm -hmm. And how could you go about seeing a comet? What is the best way to observe the tail and the nucleus of a comet? Well, let's take a look at some of the pieces of equipment that I brought in. You've got some very interesting telescopes here. We sure do. These telescopes you'd really only need if you were wanting to look at the 10 comets a year that come by that are so small that they're below naked eye visibility. But for most comets, this is all you'll need. A pair of binoculars. A pair of binoculars. Maybe mounted on a tripod like yeah, this? If you've got some real big binoculars, you're going to want to put them on a tripod. But the ones you're looking through right now are the sort of binoculars that uh, most people have lying around their house. So you don't really need fancy equipment. You don't really need fancy equipment. What about just the old naked eyes? Well, if you've got a real bright comet, like Comet West, mm -hmm. the eyes is all you need. And how do you go about then looking? How do you get the best view for the comet? There's one key thing, is you've got to get far away from the city lights. Yeah, you usually have to do that for all good astronomers. That's right. For, for a lot of things you need to, unless you're looking at the moon, which mm -hmm. is really bright. Mm -hmm. But I brought in a picture of a comet. And if we take a look at it with the studio lights down, you can see that That's it looks beautiful. really nice. Very spectacular. This is out in the middle of a field or where it's dark, you can see the stars. This is this out is in the middle of a field. You probably couldn't see all this because a time exposure photograph can pick up a lot that your eye simply can't pick up. And as you get closer to a major city, then it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. Let's bring up the lights, and now you can see that the comet is all washed out. You can barely see it at all. There's mm -hmm. lots of cases with Comet Cahotec where people could see it very nicely from way away from the city. Not at all from in the city itself. Mm -hmm. Now, to repeat again, there's really nothing then dangerous. A comet is not going to crash into the Earth and blow it up no, like many people think. a comet is not going to crash into the Earth. Every once in a while, there's little pieces of things that hit the Earth and dig out craters, but nothing to really worry about. Of course, that didn't stop people from selling Halley's Comet Pills. <laughs> These are little sugar-coated candies which were sold around 1910, and they were supposed to ward off comet sickness and make profits for the people who sold them, and they've come around again as a fundraising device. Well, they, they may be uh, not good for warding off comets, but they might keep you well-fed while you're out watching them. That's right. Thank you very much, Dr. Shipman, for that tale about comets. We'll be right back. Fascinating fact number 162. Nostrils. Even your nostrils need a breather. In fact, during normal breathing, they work in shifts. As one nostril opens up and does most of the work, the other closes down, letting less air pass through it. A regular shift is two and a half to four hours, but the older you are, the longer the cycle. No one knows why your nose divides up the work this way. What is it that keeps this wheel spinning? All of these machines, in fact, appear to be in perpetual motion, turning without any apparent source of outside power. Is this possible? Well, that's what Sheldon Rudman of Dallas, Texas, wanted to know, because he wrote us asking, with all the controversy concerning perpetual motion machines, could you please explain how they work? OK, we'll try. Here to help us with the answer is Dr. Jack Patterson from Iowa State University at Ames. Welcome to the program, Dr. Patterson. Hi. Good to see you. Hi. What is a perpetual motion machine? A perpetual motion machine is supposed to be able to make up for the energy that it loses because of its motion. Mm -hmm. Now, is that possible to do? In a word, no. <laughs> <laughs> that means it would run forever. If it, it would perpetual. run forever. That's where the word perpetual comes in. Now, why is that not possible? Well, it's because of a law called the conservation of energy. Mm -hmm. And simply put, 
it says you can't get something for nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay? And really what it means is that if you don't put energy into a machine, it will use up the energy that's in it and it will grind to a halt. Just like taking your foot off the accelerator in a car exactly. is eventually going to stop running. Exactly. I think we can demonstrate that nicely. If you'd like to sit down here, okay. we can show a simple kind of a machine called a pendulum. It's a bowling ball on a wire. All right. Okay. And if you'll press that against your nose, uh -oh. we're going to let this ball swing and lose energy as it pushes air out of the way and so forth. And if it doesn't lose any energy, It'll come back and touch your nose again. Uh, <laughs> I'd better have faith in the laws of physics. Well, uh, I've always wanted to see if this is going to work. <laughs> Why don't you go let ahead and let it go now? Now, don't flinch, Ira. Oh, <laughs> that was close. Well, but it lost. But the conservation of energy has been upheld in this Here. little experiment. And if we leave this thing run indefinitely, it will it'll swing to a halt. It will grind to a halt and stop at the bottom. Then I guess a perpetual motion machine then tries to violate the law of conservation. Exactly. If there was an outside source of energy or power coming into this thing, it would give a little boost, and then it would swing a little higher and a little higher. And that's actually the objective of the people who are working in this area the perpetual motion. And they've been trying to do it for years. This is not something new, right? Centuries, absolutely. Let's go over here and look at some of these examples over here on the board. This is the first one. Uh, as well, no, a water wheel will work uh, by a river in a stream. Mm. This is one, however, that was built to work away from a stream. The energy is consumed from the water falling down, turns the shaft, and pumps its own water back up, and then runs around. These don't even start. <laughs> but there's a genius idea. Why not just recycle the same water and use it over and over again? In a way, in, until you build one of these, there's no real way to know that it wouldn't work. Because we're, we're not putting any outside power in, in this close exactly system. Right. That's right. exactly this right. This one now, up here is intriguing. Right, that's right. And here's how it's supposed to work. It's supposed to continue turning around. As these weights fall out to the right, further away from the center, it would appear that they should overbalance the wheel to the right at the expense of these, and the thing should run forever. But as we can see... It doesn't do that. It just doesn't work. Wow. Very powerful, intuitive uh, concept You would here. think it should. Uh, yeah, you look at it and you say, it's got to work. But it's losing more energy, and it's not putting it back exactly. into the system. Exactly. If we put more of these on here, it'll lose more energy. Yeah. There's another very uh, interesting experiment over here based on buoyancy. Uh, we have the same type of wheel almost in a tank That's of water. That's exactly right. And we have uh, balloons connected together through these tubes, uh -huh. and if we squeeze one balloon shut, it'll pump up the balloon on the opposite side. I see. The idea now is to get both buoyant balloons on the one side and all on the collapsed side. ones on the other side. So, so when these become we... buoyant, they would pu push watch, the wheel up. Watch the ones over the... Uh, this one that here? One, that's right. It'll squeeze down and it blows up the other one. And when the air goes through and the And you pipe, can see it starts oh, to turn. Yes. Well, doesn't but that work? It stopped. <laughs> You'll notice that it stopped. And the reason is there's an awful lot of losses in pushing the water around, not air this time, but the water. Yeah. And uh, as a matter of fact, the thing just doesn't you, work. You, you can't make up for the loss of energy in the, in the water by because exactly. we're not putting any outside energy in. It gets to a in. point where it needs more energy coming in to get over the hill. But, you know, it, uh, once again, you'd say, give me a few years. I can yep. perfect the size of the balloon or the... Look the at it on a drawing, and you'd be convinced it would work. Mm -hmm. Look at it inside of a tank of water. Yes. And it's quite another story. Well, if we can't get a free lunch, if we can't get something for nothing here, can we get a good bargain? Yes, I mean, you can get a good price on some lunches. That device <laughs> that you had over there to begin with in the show is an example of that. This is a legitimate machine. It stopped running. It stopped running, but if you'll charge it up again, stick it in the hot water, and get some heat energy into Ooh, that look. brass wheel, it'll cause, it causes a flexing in this interesting alloy oh. called nitinol. This, this uh, wire right That's here. That's right. That's the working substance, and it just starts turning it. And if you pull it out, as long as the brass wheel stays hot, it's got energy in it, and that energy is being used up as this thing continues to work. But it's not perpetual motion. It's not perpetual motion. It's coasting to a stop. It will stop eventually when this cools off. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, th let's, let's move on to the machines over here because, uh, to yeah. me, they look almost like perpetual motion, especially yeah. the uh, bicycle wheel up here. I don't see any outside input of energy like we know there has to be. Well, and, this uh, is uh, the argument from design here. Actually, we've <laughs> tricked you a little bit. <laughs> you tricked them. <laughs> and it, we, have, we have magnets on the uh, outside rim. Oh, I and can as see they them come now. down close to the bottom, we pulse a magnet inside and actually tug. We tug on the magnets as they come down, and you'll see... Oh, that right there, there it is. inside. It's our electronic hamster. And if we, had, if, we had, <laughs> if we had cheated like that on the bowling ball, 
and given a little kick on the way over to your nose, you'd have had it in your eye. And we would have been doing this from the hospital. That's right. <laughs> what about these other machines? Are, are we cheating? Are they cheating in all these machines? I'm uh, afraid to say that they're all a little bit funny. Oh. If you pull that top off, you'll see... There's the battery and the magnet again. That's right. They're getting power from the outside source into the device that's moving, and they can run as long as the battery works. Well, I can see how somebody can be fooled. Are people still being fooled by perpetual motion? They machine? certainly are, and people are losing a lot of money every year. In this no thing. kidding. People approach them to invest in it, huh? That's exactly right. Whereas there is really no such thing as perpetual motion, we will always have with us perpetual commotion. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Patterson, right. for taking the mystery out of perpetual motion. Now, to keep the motion of our show going, we'll be right back. Back in the audience now for another question, and this time it comes in a letter from Paula Mann of State College, Pennsylvania, who writes, what is a wart? How do you get them? Can you really get them from toads? I like those questions. Here to answer them is Jan Seary, our biologist from McAllister College. Welcome to the program, Jan. Good Thanks, to see Sarah. you again. Thank you. He's making an awful lot of noise. Yes. This is a toad, mm. and I brought him on the show to demonstrate to you that I'm holding him. I'm not afraid of getting yeah. warts. You can't get warts from toads. I'll touch him. How come then that there's that mythology about well, getting warts? Well, if you notice, he toads. does have little bumps, yes, and they he does. do. And I think people think that those are warts and that they're contagious and they'll spread. But no, you don't get them from toads. So where, so where do they come from then? Well, they're caused by a virus. A virus. Now I brought a model of the virus that causes warts. Ooh. This is a papilloma virus. This is a big virus. It's about 100 million <laughs> times bigger than the actual virus. It has protein around the outside and DNA, genetic material on the inside and it invades the skin cells and causes them to grow into a wart. Mm -hmm. And there are um, all kinds of different kinds of warts. Some, the common wart you get on your hands, and then I think a lot of people know about the planter's wart on the right. bottom of your foot. Well, if it's caused by a virus, does that mean it's contagious or that it, it can spread on your skin? Yeah, it can. It can spread on your skin, and it can actually spread from person to person. It is contagious. But most people mm -hmm. are immune to warts, and so people don't generally have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. so, and, that and that explains why uh, you can outgrow warts when yeah. you're a kid? You yeah, get your immune system gets better as you get older and mm -hmm. so you don't have to worry. Well, what about the fighting off warts then? I mean, if you get them like that caused by viruses, viruses are very hard to overcome. Yeah, they are. Yeah, extremely hard. And so a permanent cure for warts, we don't have yet. Mm -hmm. People are working on it. But until we get a permanent cure, you can excise the wart itself and doctors do that by burning it out or by using a laser beam on it or by cryosurgery that's uh, freezing, freezing it yes. off, yeah, and various uh, treatments. There, of course, have been treatments for warts for a long, long time, folk remedies, and I brought some <laughs> of those along, I too. recognize some of these. Okay, rubbing a penny on it and, and rubbing a potato or a carrot or even a dandelion on it. And people and swear by these, don't they? Well, they do swear yeah. by them. Now, at, on the face of it, you'd say, well, of course, there's, there's really no scientific evidence for this, but there's a growing body of scientific evidence that what you that if you believe that something is going to happen, some physical cure is going to happen, like you believe you're going to get rid of your warts, that that triggers something physically in your body. Yeah, that your brain, in your, in your nervous system. Yeah, that your brain is able to trigger your immune system so mm -hmm. that it overcomes the virus better. Just mm -hmm. believing it may actually make it so. And that's why if you believe these may work, then you may get rid Yeah, of maybe. Them. It's a possibility. Well, thank you very much, Jan. Thank you, a toady friend. I think that Ernie is going to be really jealous today. <laughs> <I hope not. laughs> you know, they say that history repeats itself. Well, if that's true, keep an eye out for the return of these next historic moments. Now there's something. It might be an epoch-making year in the Earth's history, also the moons and maybe Mars if things had gone right for the enthusiastic inventor of the world's most amazing stratogyroplane. Built to leap into the stratosphere and just float there while the world revolved beneath it. Either that or to whir its way up to the Milky Way, the odd craft had an auspicious launching. Strange. It should have been at least five miles in the air by now. And there must be a screw loose or something. You can't phase a really determined inventor, though. He just smiles at minor mishaps. Imagine walking home from a stratosphere ride. A 
Another V-2 rocket is prepared for launching by the Army Air Forces at White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico. A world's altitude record of 104 miles has been established here, and the U.S. is fast catching up in rocket warfare. Something's wrong. The rocket is dropping down off course. A rocket boomerang. So much for modern technology. Now, for our next segment, we went underwater for a close look at animals who are rather dangerous to get close to. Where can you be surrounded by sharks but in absolutely no danger? Here at SeaWorld in Orlando, we're in the tube in a shark encounter with curator Frank Maru. Welcome to the program, Frank. Thank you. How deep are we underwater here? Right now, we're 16 feet below the surface of the water. Mm. If we go upstairs to another viewing area, we can uh, get a better idea of just how big this facility really is. It is big. Look at those sharks swimming around. I've never been this close to a shark and felt so safe before. <laughs> what kinds of sharks do you have in there? We've got uh, four different species of sharks in here. Uh, we've got about 30 sharks total right now in this part of the shark encounter. These classic-looking sharks with the big dorsal fins are brown sharks. Bull sharks look somewhat like brown sharks, but bulls are bigger and beefier. Now, the sand tiger shark looks ferocious, but it's actually not very aggressive. Then there are the nurse sharks, who spend most of their time resting on the bottom. We see there are other fish in the tank besides the sharks here. Do they eat these fish every once in a while? Well, occasionally they do uh, pick off one or two of them, but uh, for the most part, we keep our sharks very well fed. Sharks are primarily fish eaters. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some that feed on invertebrates and different types of mollusks and that mm -hmm. type of thing. But, uh, but uh, we're going to have an opportunity to, you're going to have a good opportunity <laughs> to feed uh, some of these Me sharks. Me feed them? <laughs> you feed them. <laughs> All right, let's go. Okay, we're upstairs at the shark encounter now. A lot of sharks circling around this A lot this of area. sharks. I'm not getting too close. <laughs> We've got 30 big ones in here right now. Mm -hmm. uh, How do you feed we're them? We're going to... Uh, we're going to do that right now. We're going to take one of these. Take one of those. These are tongs. This is what we use to feed each of the each of the sharks with. And we have uh, some cut up fish in here. This is blue runner. It's good quality fish for them. Why are we feeding them like this? Why don't we just throw the fish in the water? Well, we do this for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that so that we can keep very accurate records, and uh, we'll know exactly. Oh. <laughs> He we'll just took it right away. <laughs> we'll know exactly who gets what, just like that one there. We'll take that and we'll record it on this sheet here. Uh, we also give a variety of vitamin and mineral supplements to them, and we want to make sure that everybody's getting a good balanced diet. We can't really tell once they get in a big swirl who got what, and also they, they could very easily damage one another because when they, they just kind of bite at anything that happens to be in the area, including each other. <laughs> <laughs> He hit me in the side of the arm. Did he get you? <laughs> yeah. He just hit me with his tail. Even after they've just been fed, these sharks still look hungry. But looks can be deceptive. Sharks both here and in the wild don't eat very often, one or two good meals a week. And contrary to popular belief, very few people have been attacked by sharks and even fewer killed by them. Still, the SeaWorld staff is extremely cautious. When sharks are caught in the wild, it's quite a job to be sure neither the people nor the sharks get hurt. Okay, we're using a technique called long lining, and uh, we're actually setting the long line. It's exactly what it sounds like. We're setting a very long line. It may have anywhere from 50 to 100 hooks on it with some very large pieces of bait. I'll these say. Are, these are the baits that we're uh, setting on the hook now. They're very long leaders coming off of the, the main line. Well, by hooking, by hooking a shark, aren't you hurting it at all? Not, not much. Uh, it's uh, hook, usually hooked right in the corner of the mouth, and we found that the sharks actually have a very... Uh, quick recuperative period and uh, mm -hmm. doesn't affect them much at all. Once we hook a shark and bring it in, we uh, put it in a, a stretcher and put it in a live well in the boat. 
uh, where we can uh, assess the health of the animal. Now, then you put it in the environment over here, right? Right. Uh -huh. Now, this is a very interesting tank, and I think we ought to talk about it because it's not just a round, circular, big tank that a lot of aquariums have. You've designed right. it very carefully, very scientifically, right? Right. We, we did a lot of uh, research into the design of a tank before we actually built the shark encounter. Mm. Uh, we found over uh, a period of years of keeping sharks that... Uh, some of the circular configurations and the rectangular configurations create a lot of problems for the sharks. Really? Uh, they, first of all, they don't navigate corners very well. Mm -hmm. uh, so a rectangular tank presented a, an unusual problem for a shark. And then uh, we found that a circular tank, the sharks would constantly circle in one direction, which over a, a large number of years would actually create uh, equilibrium problems and other medical problems for the shark. That uh, well, they, they um, lean to one side all the time? They, they really? tend to over a, a long period of time to, to lean to one side, or and we, it was almost impossible to get them to swim the other direction. So we couldn't correct that situation. <laughs> Does this tank make them swim in two directions? Then? This, this tank, because of its uh, kind of a modified dumbbell-shaped design, uh, actually forces the shark uh, at some point in his navigation of the tank to swim in the opposite direction. This pool is 125 feet long. The length is important because brown sharks need long stretches of water to glide and rest so they can rid themselves of metabolic wastes. In a circular tank, the sharks would have to swim constantly, always turning to follow the contour of the pool. And without rest, many would die of exhaustion. This is an important discovery. In fact, so little is known about the ocean-going sharks that it's important to keep and study them. Even the basic things like their reproductive cycles, uh, how long they live, we know nothing like that, and hopefully facilities like this will be able to give us the answer to some of those questions. This is more than just a beautiful exhibit. That's right. It's much more. Thank you very much, Frank Maru, for uh, keeping us on this side of the glass, at least this time. That's about all the time we have for now. So we'll see you next time on Newton's Apple. Newton's Apple is made possible by a grant from DuPont. Makers of better things for better living. also by this station and other public television stations. Man, your mission is to decide if the forthcoming statements are true or false. 
If a statement is true, eat the letter T. If it is false, eat the letter F. You will have until the count of seven to make your decision. And beware the scoundrelescent Mr. Glitch. Oh, oh man. He will decimate you if you are wrong. Math man, math man, math man, math man, math man, math man. Yeah. True or false? You need to be fast to be good at math. Think, 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 uh, false. Solving the problem is more important than speed. Yeah, oh. Yeah, you bet. Oh ho. Math man, math man, math man, math man, math man, math man. Use your head, math man, math man. I kid that. True or false? You need to be a brainiac to be good at math. A brainiac? False again. I'm good at math and I'm no brainiac. That's for sure. All sorts of people can be good at math. Even you, Glitch. Well, maybe not you. Congratulations, math man. You've destroyed all the math myths I can think of at the present time. Free game. I want a free game because I'm smart. Woohoo! Yeah, I am so good at math. Uh, listen to this. One times three is three. Uh, four times five uh, uh, isn't three. It's something else. This is Wrigley Field in Chicago, one of the most famous ballparks in the country. Note that we put 58 baseball cards into the infield. How many baseball cards would fit into the entire playing field, the infield and the outfield? The theme for today's show is the world of sports, so let's meet the member of our studio audience whose estimate came closest. It's Michael Holly. Come on down, Michael! Congratulations, you are our studio challenger. I want you to meet our other two contestants, Tazleem Donji and Jeff Spees. Welcome all! Now, we're awarding you points based on how close your estimate was to the actual number of baseball cards it would take to fit in the entire playing field. So, Reggie, let's see what we've got here. Well, Louisa, you ready? Yes. There are 458 baseball cards that fit into the entire playing field. Isn't that something? Let's see how we did here. Tazleen, you estimated? I said 200 baseball cards. 200? You get 10 points for that estimate. All right. <laughs> Jeff? I said 510 baseball cards. All right. You get 40 points for that estimate. That was a very good estimate. Congratulations. Michael, what did you estimate? Well, 483. Okay. You get 40 points as well. You're off to a great start. Okay. Let's move to our second round, and good luck, everybody. We want you to meet two outstanding track athletes. Now, let's give them a big hand. All right. Larry and Cynthia. <laughs> pole vaulters. I think that's great. Yeah. Tell me, uh, do you enjoy pole vaulting? Well, I'll tell you the truth, Reg. It's, uh, it's got its ups and downs. <laughs> let's play close call. Contestants, you'll notice that this pole has been painted yellow. Now, this yellow section of the pole measures 59 centimeters. What we want you guys to estimate is... How long in centimeters is the entire pole? The yellow section is 59 centimeters. How long in centimeters is the entire pole? Now, think, think about, about it. it and write your answers down. <laughs> Okay, let's see how our estimators did. Tazleen, what did you estimate? I estimated 240 centimeters. 240 centimeters, okay, Jeff? I estimated 290 centimeters. 290 centimeters, Jeff says. And Michael? I estimated 409 centimeters. 409 centimeters, okay. Well, let's see how close our estimators are, Reg. Well, Louisa, you know that the length of the entire pole in centimeters is on the estimator meter, oh. along with a whole range of other possibilities. Guys, 
We want to know what you think. Hit it. All right, let's see how we did here. Tazleen, you estimated 240 centimeters. You get 20 points for that for a total of 30 points. Very good. <laughs> Jeff, you estimated 290 centimeters. You get 30 points for that estimate for a total of 70 points. You're doing great. Michael, you estimated 409 centimeters. You get 40 points for that for a total of 80 points. Louise, I'm excited about this. Are you ready for this? Think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, what brings you to New York? We're on a promotional junket for the Tour de Peoria. Yeah. Yes. We're crisscrossing the entire country trying to sign up more racers. Well, and how many have signed up for the race so far? Well, there's uh, us. Uh, and uh, him. Wow, how do you like that? <laughs> well, this should be a dynamic race. Oh, let's uh, do a big hat. Let's play Close Call. This is Jeff Gordon, and he's riding a unicycle. Now, we know that the circumference, that's the distance around the wheel, measures 155 centimeters thank you louisa and what we want you to do is to estimate the circumference of the front wheel on the bicycle built for four so the unicyclist wheel the small one is 155 centimeters and we want you to estimate the circumference of the front wheel on the bicycle built for four now think about it and write your estimates down <laughs> Okay, let's see what we've got here, Tazleem. I said 455 centimeters. 455 centimeters, all right. And Jeff? I said 308 centimeters. 308 centimeters. Michael, what was your estimate? 999 centimeters. 999. Okay, well, let's see how close we got. The correct answer is 223 centimeters. <laughs> 223. All right. Tazleen, you estimated 455. You get 10 points for that for a total of 40 points. All right. Jeff, you estimated 308 centimeters. You get 20 points for that estimate for a total of 90 points. Very good. Michael, you were on the high range of the estimate. You estimated 999. You get 10 points for that for a total of 90 points as well. We've got a tie here. Our champion wins this beautiful Square One TV jacket. You'll be the envy of all your friends who'll want to borrow it to go estimating in. And the still sensational Square One watch, as well as a gift certificate for sneakers. Our runners-up will take home this trendy sport jester gym bag and this solar-powered hologram laser calculator. Congratulations to all of you. The story you are about to see is a fib, but it's short. The names are made up, but the problems are real. It was Thursday, 9.43 a.m., and New Yorkers were agog by the darling of Long Island, a seismologist named Alfred Foote. The doctor had discovered a new fault and predicted that an earthquake would strike with an epicenter directly under the tennis complex in Forest Hills. It was known as the Foot Fault. I was working the day watch out of MathNet. My partner is George Frankly. The boss is Joe Greco. My name is Tuesday. I'm a mathematician. George and I found ourselves immersed in the world of number sequences and big-time minor league baseball. We decided to look at earlier scenes to warm up. See, normally 
I can figure them out. A young girl named Babs Bengal was the ball girl for the Rivervale Rowdies, a hot minor league baseball team managed by her grandfather, an eccentric legend named Casey Bengal. She had been playing a number sequencing game with a rowdy star player, Roy Lefty Cobbs. One, three, seven, fifteen. And the game is? The game is, the other guy has to guess what the next four numbers are. That's not much of a game, Babs. The next four numbers could be any four numbers. <laughs> Babs explained the rules of the game and said her opponent had flipped out. Flipped out? Yes. Can't make any sense out of his pattern. Babs oh showed us examples and Roy didn't seem to be playing with a full rosin bag. We made a call on Lefty at the ballpark and he put on quite a show. We also clocked Lefty's pitches. He was throwing the ball at 143 miles per hour. Lefty's constant companion and mentor was a strange duck named Dr. Frank N. Steenbrenner. That's enough, me. No sense giving me any more to look at for free. Into the locker room and I'll ice you down. Isn't it a great day for baseball? We decided to run a background check on Dr. Frank N. Steenbrenner and found he played baseball at Michigan Agricultural College. We talked with his ex-coach, now retired. Is it true that you kicked him off the team? Yes, I did. Why? For betting on the game. When we returned to MathNet HQ, Benny had news of Steenbrenner's latest gimmick. You haven't heard about his auction? What auction? Cobb to be sold the highest bidder. Man with golden arm to be auctioned Friday. Morning, George. Good morning, Martha. Martha? Martha is your wife, George. I'm Pat, your partner. That's nice. George, did you get any sleep last night? Not really. I got this number sequence in my head and I can't get rid of it. Did you go home last night? Oh, sure, of course. I had a host a dinner party. Oh? Uh, there was Martha's friends from the UN. United Nations? Uh-huh. Wow. What did you talk about? To tell you the truth, I was so beat. It's hard to remember. Uh... I think it was about not having a nuclear war or something. You want to turn off the alarm, Martha? Math Net Tuesday. Oh, hi, Bab. What? Where? Be right there, Bab. George. George, wake up. Just five more minutes, Mark. George, that was Bab. She has Lefty Cobbs with her and she wants to meet us. Let's roll. Look what? Hi, Miss Tuesday. Thanks for coming. I've been trying to tell Lefty he's making a big mistake by becoming a free agent now. Lefty, these are my friends. Pat Tuesday. George Frankly. Matt Matt Matt. Matt. Uh, Babs, how did you get Lefty away from Dr. Steenbrenner? He was on the phone for a long time, talking to some major league owner. I just asked Lefty if he'd come for coffee. He said okay. I said okay. I said that. I heard myself. Lefty, has Babs convinced you to wait until after the minor league World Series before you sell yourself to the highest bidder? Yes. Babs has convinced me to wait until after the minor league World Series before I sell myself to the highest bidder. Gee, that's terrific. Great. That means you'll pitch today. If you win. We'll win the pennant and then go into the World Series. Fabulous. So what's the problem? Isn't it a great day for baseball? 
Yes. Of course, there's the threat of rain with possible highway flooding and high winds. Don't confuse him, Mr. Franklin. Heaven forbid, Babs. Uh-oh. There you are. What do you want, Dr. Frank M. Steenbrenner? My property. Dr. Steenbrenner, I just want you to know that Lefty has agreed to stay on with the team through the World Series. He has agreed to nothing. I hold his contract and it is being sold tomorrow morning. His word means nothing. Nothing, do you hear me? Get up, Lefty, now. And another thing. Where's my number sequence? You'll get it, you little baby. Babs, did you send Lefty a coded message? Uh-huh. Here's what I sent. A simple alphanumeric code, 1 through 26. Each number represents the corresponding letter in the alphabet. Uh-huh. Sorry for dragging you out here for no reason. That's okay, Babs. We tried. We tried, but Steenbrenner has Lefty sewed up tighter than a drum. Sorry, I've got to go. The game starts in about an hour. Maybe we'll come out and watch. Oh, okay. I'll leave a couple of ducats at the will call booth. A couple of what? Where? Two freebies for the game. Oh, sure. Pard, take me out to the ball game. Good afternoon, sports fans. Dick and Vern here at the Aaron Burr Memorial Sports Complex, where history is about to unfold. Right, Vern? Isn't that the truth, Dick? And what a spectacle. What a wonderful spectacle. And what wonderful fans. Dozens and dozens of them out there. I think there are more than dozens and dozens, Vern. And I know you do, Dick, but uh, you were never very good at estimating crowds. What do you mean by that? I mean, when you covered the Hindenburg disaster, you didn't even know anybody was on board. That's not true. What People I said... People falling out of the skies, and you're saying it's a beautiful day for the docking. Moving right along, we may well see baseball history made here today. Well, that's what I'm counting on in this game between the two arch rivals, the River Rail Rowdies and the Secaucus Seven. Don't most baseball teams have nine players, Vern? Yes, but the Secaucus Seven are very, very common. Exciting, Pat. Uh huh. Sit on my hot dog, Mac. Here you go, buddy. It's all flat. Yes, sir. But if you will note, the volume has not changed, only the shape. I still obtain the same nutrients as though I'd never uh, spotted on it. We're well, searching for a word chagrin would pop to mind. Swallow in good health. George, it's bad. Because he was busy. Sam, I'll be right back. Right. Okay. And, uh, had the paper bag right down on the chair. He started to the Oh, oh, oh. Excuse me, sir. Yes, sir. Will you be coming back this way in a foreseeable future? I don't know. Why? Uh, I was just wondering whether or not I should get home and get my clock. I got Lefty's answer, but I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Maybe you could, uh... Sure thing, Bab. Thanks, Bab. We'll take it back to the office and work on it. Back to the office? What about the game? Fly ball! Thanks, Mr. Frankly. Yeah, but the game! George. Here's Bab's message. To Lefty? Uh-huh. 
Here's what she said. 1, 18, 5, 25, 15, 21, 15, 11. Which means? Well, using this alphanumeric code, 1 is A. 18, the 18th letter of the alphabet, is R. Here, let me. Five, the fifth letter of the alphabet. E. Twenty-five is Y. Fifteen is O. Twenty-one is U. R U. Fifteen is O. Yep. And Eleven is K. Are you okay? That's Babs's message to Lefty. What did he say? I know what he said the other day. Hey, how much longer is it going to take you to finish the ceiling? It took Michelangelo four years to paint the Sistine Chapel, you know. Yeah, but he didn't have a roller. What who said? The numbers. The ones you left on the board. With this? Yeah. Using that code, it spells captain. C A P T I V E. I'll be darned. What's his latest response? I'll be hornswoggled. Which is it, darned or hornswoggled? This is the same gosh darn message you sent the other day. It is? I think so. No, it's not. It's the same except for two numbers in the front. 14, 15. Except for those, it's exactly the same. His other numbers spelled out captive. Maybe Lefty's been sending a code. All this time. Pat, write this down. 14 is N. 15 is O. Okay, 11 is K. Holy cow. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut the path of the game. Continue working on the code. Use this. No score after eight and one half innings. Have you ever seen a game like this in your life, Bird? Uh, not today, Dick, but I overslept. We're in the bottom of the ninth inning, two out, Lefty Cobbs, who's pitching a perfect game, is coming to bat. He's 27 batters and not allowed a base hit. Besides not allowing a base hit, Vern, he struck every one of those batters out. Yes, it reminds me of the time I used to tow the rubber for the Detroit Tigers, Dick. You pitched for the Tigers, Vern? Uh, no, I just towed the rubber, Dick. Did you hear that, Pat? Two out in the last of the ninth. No score and Lefty's at bat. George. I'm getting a very strange message. Lefty Cobbs has been up three times and had three hits. Yes, but is he happy? Here's the first pitch. Ball one, low and away. Ball one, Pat. He couldn't have hit that ball with a boat oar. You think they'll give him an intentional pass, Vern? No, I don't, Dick. I think they'll walk him. Ball two. George. Not now, Pat. Game's in the line. George. Lefty's been kidnapped. Ball three in the dirt. Kidnapped? What do you mean he's been kidnapped? I'm looking at him. Bass's message asked, are you okay, right? Right. His answer is, no. Kidnapped. Here's the 3-0 and pitch to Lefty Cobbs. That ball could be out of here. Way, way back in left field. Home run for Lefty Cobbs. Home run for Lefty Cobbs. The Rowdies win it. The Rowdies win it. The Rowdies win it. I thought he swung at ball four, Dick.
pat. Lefty just won the game. He says he's been kidnapped. Well, for someone who's kidnapped, he sure has a good stroke. Look. No kidnapped. Cackpick, I had to be. Doesn't make a lot of sense, Pat. Well, the first part does. Pat, it's got to be a hoax that Lefty is playing on Babs for some reason. It makes no sense. He's not kidnapped. We just saw him win one of the most dramatic games in the history of baseball. George, I know it doesn't seem to make sense, but... Tuesday. Yes, Sergeant Abruzzi. Who? Send him up. Coach Koch. Coach Koch? Hi, math letters. Coach, Coach Koch. Koch. What a surprise. Well, I hope I'm not intruding on you. Not at all, Coach. Don't touch the ceiling. What can we do for you? I remembered the answer. To the questions you asked me the other day about Frank N. Steenbrenner and what he got his degree in. Oh, yes, Coach Koch. What was his major? Well, he went from hotel management to animal husbandry to sports medicine to the last thing he majored in. Which was? Robotics. Robotics? Yep. I looked it up. Well, that's very nice of you, Coach Koch. But you came all the way from West Lansing to New York just to tell us that. Why didn't you call us on the phone? The what? Anything to add, Pat? George? I still think Lefty's been kidnapped. For 150 million years, this creature and its relatives ruled the Earth. What secrets lie hidden in their bones? Well, coming up next on Newton's Apple, we'll piece together the story of the dinosaur. Also, Bulletproof Vests, How a Fabric Can Save Lives. All this and more next on Newton's Apple. Welcome to Newton's Apple. Newton's Apple is made possible by a grant from DuPont, makers of better things for better living. And also by this station and other public television stations. And now your host, science correspondent, Ira Clayton. Thank you. Welcome again to Newton's Apple. Do you wonder about nature, marvel at technology or the human body? Are you just curious about the world around you? Well, then you've come to the right place because we're here to answer your questions. So, let's go right to our first question. Hi, my name is Lynn Rubright, and I watch Newton's Apple in St. Louis on KETC. And I am fascinated by the big skeletons of dinosaurs I see in museums. And I've been wondering, how do scientists begin their study when all they have to begin with are the bones? That's a thoughtful question, and here to answer that question is Rob Long of the University of California at Berkeley. Rob, how do you begin to study a dinosaur? Well, we were able to catch this dinosaur. <laughs> you didn't catch this dinosaur. Look at this. <laughs> this is not real, is it? No. <laughs> oh, look, it's moving and everything. What kind of dinosaur does this represent? This is Triceratops, and it's only one half size. Triceratops. It lived about 65 million years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, what can you tell about this dinosaur and other dinosaurs by their bones. You must be able to tell an awful lot, right? Well, we have not only their bones, we have their footprints, and we have eggs and nests. So we have a lot to work on. Mm -hmm. uh, on this dinosaur, for example, we have evidence of great herds of these living in Montana and Wyoming during no the, the, the end of the age of dinosaurs. Because you find the bones there. Right. Great numbers of bones, thousands of bones. Uh, we think he probably lived in herds. Mm -hmm. And also his crest oftentimes has uh, gashes, pits, indicating that these things fought and with, and mm -hmm. with their horns. Now, can you tell us about what he ate? I mean, how do you study that? Well, we study his teeth. 
and he has oh, very strong sense. teeth. Uh, but he, the, they are the teeth of a plant eater, so he probably ate, well, palm leaves, mm. uh, which were very common at that time. Let's talk about dinosaurs in general. Where would you find them living? I mean, Triceratops and the other dinosaurs. Well, see, they lived for about a period of 150 million years, and they lived everywhere. Huh. We find them on all continents. It was a very warm, subtropical co climate, very kind to the dinosaurs. They thrived. They did, and they were very successful for oh. 150 million years. What? Humans oh. have been around for a few million. <laughs> yeah. So even though they died out, they really were. They knew oh. what they were doing all right. And we know of at least 150 different kinds. Big ones and small ones? And yeah, chicken-sized ones up to giants, as, you know, as big as 10, 15 elephants. Mm. Ooh. Well, if the bones tell you... The, the general structure of the dinosaur, how do you know what the outsides of them look like? How do you know what, how the skin looked, the color, the texture, things like that? Well, we have skin impressions. Of all and, the dinosaurs? Well, no, just of a few of them. But uh, when some of these dinosaurs died on mud flats, they actually left scale impressions really? in the mud, and we have been able to restore the uh, skin. And if you don't find skin impressions of dinosaurs, how do you figure out what the outside looks like? Well, oftentimes you compare it to uh, living reptiles and uh, for coloration. And, or alligators and, such. and things yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, right. All right, but let's say you do find bones. What do you do to put it together to create a, a magnificent dinosaur? All right, like let's this? start at the bones. Come over here. I want okay. to show you this. Boy, have you got a bone to pick with me? <laughs> Actually, this is a juvenile dinosaur. This is a, a brontosaur thigh bone. A brontosaur, that's that big dinosaur with the, the giant neck and the head right, that used to come right. down in the swamp. And a full adult would have a femur that high. Hmm. Well, wait a minute, let me stop you first, because you immediately recognize this as a brontosaur bone. How do you know? That's all part of the game, I see. How do you know that this is a brontosaur bone? A lot of digging. Over the last hundred <laughs> years, a number of skeletons have been found, and they have been found with their limb bones. So we take an isolated bone like this and compare them to the limb bones from full skeletons. Well, let's say I was digging my garden, right. okay? And I found one of these bones lying down there, and uh -huh. I, I know my dog didn't bury it, right? <laughs> I bring it to you. How do you tell, without seeing it among other bones, what kind of well, you're going to hate bonus. me for this, but I break it. <laughs> yeah. I try not to break it in too many pieces. Uh, brontosaur bones are solid, mm -hmm. uh, whereas all other dinosaur bones were hollow. Oh, no because kidding. these are monsters. They, they got up to, you know, 50 tons. Mm. So they need massive bones. Getting back to the isolated bone, we can tell that it was four-legged animal. Hell. You see this bulge right here. Mm -hmm. That's where a muscle fit on. And... We know by dissecting chicks, of all things. Chickens? Chickens. You, wait a minute, wait, right. a minute, wait a minute. You, tell about, you can tell about a dinosaur bone by dissecting chickens? Right. Why right. chickens? Well, chickens are, of course, birds, and birds are very close to the ancestry of dinosaurs, and chickens are easy to get. Oh. And, but in dissecting chickens, which we know walked on their hind legs, right. this bulge was much higher up. It gave, gave more swing into the femur. When, when, you, get, when you get this bulge down here near the midsection, it indicates a much more ponderous animal and one that walked on all fours. You really have to be Sherlock Holmes to understand uh. how this works. Well, of course, if you find more bones together in one spot, then it's easier to put a skeleton together. Right? Oh, yes, yes. And, but we have made some mistakes. But look, come over here. I want to show you these. Now, here are a couple of tail vertebrae of a brontosaur, and they were found together. They fit very nicely. Right. And when scientists find them together, like, there seems to be no problem as no. far as figuring out what the dinosaur looked like. I can understand when they're all lined up in a row, you should have no problem. Right. But the head end has presented some problems. <laughs> the head end of this dinosaur? Right, right. About 70 years ago, there was a skeleton found, yeah. and beautiful. All the bones were together, but the head was about 12 feet away. So? So, they, oh. naturally, they put it on the, uh, the end of the uh, neck, and they mounted it. No problem. Right. And all the other museums that had headless brontosaurs... Uh, did the same did thing. The, yes. They made their own heads and right. mounted them up there? Right. In 1979, they realized it was the wrong head. <laughs> it was the wrong head. Right. And they went over and they changed all of the skeletons. <laughs> you, you mean all those years when I was a kid, I was going to the right. museum? Right. It was the wrong head right. on the brontosaurus. Wrong guy entirely. <laughs> well, I'm glad they went about and changed it. Right. Well, then I guess for a, a scientist, the best of all worlds is to find a skeleton totally intact. Oh. It sounds like a rare event. It so. is a very rare event. But let me show you this guy. Now, here is a small duckbill dinosaur, actually probably a baby. Mm -hmm. And there were about five of them found together, and they were found in a nest with eggs. Okay. And uh, a much larger uh, individual of the same species was found very close to it. It was probably one of the parents. No, it's the parents. Right. And so we have, for the first time, what looks like a family nursery. 
And you really never knew or could prove that dinosaurs lived in family units like that? Well, we that. found eggs and we found some bones of little animals, but we never found them all together. That is truly amazing. Let me point out something that looks uh, fascinating here is that the head on this dinosaur looks so much bigger in relationship to the body than the heads on the other dinosaurs that we've seen. Does that mean it's got a much bigger brain in there? Well, it's, it's a, it has a fairly big brain, mm -hmm. but there are much larger brain dinosaurs. Let me show you the Einstein of dinosaurs. <laughs> the Einstein of dinosaurs. All right. Look at the eyes on this dinosaur. They really are spooky looking. Now, he, you say he's the Einstein. What do you mean the Einstein of dinosaurs? He has a whopping big brain. Really? He only weighs about 100 pounds, but his brain is larger than that of, say, a brontosaur, which weighed, of course, many tons. No kidding. Well, what does a brain this size do for a dinosaur like this? It allows him to be a very keen hunter. What do you mean by that? Well, it would coordinate a whole series of activities. Uh, he has those huge eyes, and you notice they're directed straight forward. That's yeah. different than the other dinosaurs. Right. He has binocular vision, like we do, so mm -hmm. we can center in. He can focus in on animals. Mm -hmm. That helps when you're oh, hunting. Right. When he's, when he, and you notice how big his hands are, yes. and his thumbs are opposable, like our thumbs. This animal might have gone after mammals. So he can grasp right. what he's going so after then. He'll huh? just grab now, and he has them. But look at those feet. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's equipped with everything. Huge <laughs> claws on, on his feet. Yes. And this is probably for kicking a uh, much larger prey and just ripping out the stomach. Mm -hmm. So he really is built for hunting and, and far more advanced than the other dinosaurs. Well, let's say he's a far more talented dinosaur. <laughs> but unfortunately for this dinosaur and the rest of the dinosaurs, they all died out, what, 65 million right, years ago? Right, And the $64 question is, what happened to the dinosaurs? There Why? Are all kinds of theories. There are probably over 100 theories. Okay. And some of the most popular ones are the asteroid theory a tremendous asteroid hitting the earth mm. and causing extinction. There's also uh, the, the climate changing, it becoming colder, and the mammals taking over. So th you have a great number of theories, and one theory doesn't seem to explain it all. So right. maybe it was a whole combination of theories, mm. or maybe none of them fit, and maybe we'll never know. Ooh, that's, a, that's an interesting thought to end on. Thank you, Rob, for picking through the bones of the dinosaurs with us. We'll have more in a minute. judge a bear by its cover. Though a polar bear may look as white as its wintry world, its skin is actually black. You can't see through its fur, but sunlight can get through and is reflected down the shore hairs onto the skin. Because of its dark color, the skin absorbs the light and helps the bear keep warm during the winter. That explosion was a 357 Magnum bullet fired through this stack of wooden boards, and it went through about nine boards before it finally stopped. And as you can see, a bullet from almost any kind of firearm has an incredible amount of impact power, power that most of us have little feeling for until, until you see something like this. Now, we created this demonstration to answer a question sent in by Randy Bradshaw of Avon, Ohio, who writes... How do bulletproof vests and bulletproof windows stop a bullet? Here to provide the answers is Lou Miner, engineer from the DuPont Research Labs in Wilmington, Delaware. Welcome to the program, Lou. It's a pleasure to be here. Arnold. That was a powerful demonstration. How is it possible that bulletproof vests can stop a bullet like that? Well, first off, let me correct you on one term. There's no such material that's bulletproof. Ooh. The proper term is bullet resistant. There's always a bullet that'll go through a vest like That's this. That's right. Now, uh, here is a bullet resistant vest. Notice how light it is. It's very, very light. There must be a secret to the fabric that does something here. Yes, isn't it incredible? Let me show you the, the material that's the real key to this. This, li this, this, real, this fabric? Yeah. Yes, look how yeah. thin it is and feels very light. How right. does it work? Okay, the key to it is the, uh, the aramid fiber that is woven into the fabric. This is aramid fiber. That's a, a special kind of fiber. It's not like my sweater made out of wool or anything like no, that. No, that's right. It's a very strong specialty fiber. Uh, when the bullet first encounters this fabric, mm -hmm. the, uh, just a few fibers are uh, encountered by the bullet, and they spread the energy outward. And soon, 
the fibers, all the fibers in the fabric are, are sharing this, this energy. Oh, I see. By spreading it out in a larger area, you've deadened the impact on one little spot. You've lessened it. But how, how is the fiber is able to absorb it before the bullet goes through it? Well, the fiber is so strong that it can deform before it breaks. I see. That's very, very interesting. Yeah, there's another way to show this by this trampoline over here. You want me to get on this? Yes, why don't you get on there and bounce up and down? I'll make believe I'm a bullet hitting the fiber then. Okay. okay. Now notice that three things are happening. Number one, the trampoline is deforming downward. Mm -hmm. Secondly, energy is transmitted along the plane of the trampoline. And the, the third thing that's happening is that you're responding elastically by bouncing up and down. I'm also bending my knees. Uh, I'm really getting a push from this, but the bullet doesn't really, you know, move like I am. It's not elastic, is it? Now, remember, the bullet is lead and will deform. Oh, so whereas it's going to crush us. That's yeah. right, whereas you can respond by, bound, by bending your knees. Now, we've placed some aramid fabric for a demonstration. Oh, so we're going to shoot at that one now? Yes, if you'll okay. come over here. Now, are we going to fire the same bullet we fired at the wood into the fabric? That's right. Uh, Bruce Wojak, who is a uh, uh, firearms instructor, has loaded a 357 Magnum jacketed soft point bullet. Mm -hmm. It's like he has a very special firing mechanism there. It doesn't at all look like a handgun. That's, that's right. This is a laboratory device that we've set up for this demonstration. So we just people at home shouldn't think they can do this at home very safely. We don't want them to try it. Absolutely not. And notice that we're standing behind a plastic screen to protect right. us in right. case there's any ricochet. Okay. Okay, we're ready to go. If you can put on your ear protectors. You ready, Ira? I'm ready. Okay, here we go. Whoa. Okay, let's get these ear protectors off and take a look at what happened. Look at that. It really did make a, at least it went through the first part of the... Yes, well, you know, there's an awful lot of energy involved. That bullet was traveling well above the speed of sound. Hmm. You get these straps the off. Ooh, look at that. It, it did not go through the aramid. That's right. The aramid captured the bullet. But it made it, look at that depression it made in the clay. What would that do to somebody who was wearing this? Oh, that would cause a, a severe bruise and, and some lacerations. It's like being hit very hard with a hammer. But at least you'd still be alive, right? That's right. That's the important thing. Mm. Now, I brought along some slides to show you. These are uh, high-speed photos of a similar experiment. Here comes the bullet approaching the fabric. Look at the shadow of the bullet yeah. on the fabric. Yeah. Now it just encounters a few yarns, and there's that, the wave. That diamond-shaped pattern, what is that? That's right. That's a stress wave traveling at the speed of sound, and now the bullet bounces off like your trampoline. <laughs> Actually bounced right off the fabric. Yeah. Now what about bulletproof glass? Does bulletproof glass work the same way? In a similar fashion, but remember the key word is bullet resistant. Bullet resistant. Let me show you over here. This is a piece of very tough plastic that has been laminated together. So it's not glass at all, then? No, no, glass would be far too brittle. It would shatter. And when you say laminated, I can count one, two, three, four layers. That's of right, and it's put together with a very elastic adhesive. Now, we've set up another demonstration with this material. If you'll come on over here, we're, we're almost ready to fire. Bruce has loaded a bullet. Let's get behind our protective shield and put the ear protectors back on. So now we're looking through the plastic straight into the barrel of the gun. That's right. Wow. Oh, let's take a look at that one. Look at that hole. It's just like a crater on the moon. Yeah. Look at the way the bullet's deformed. Mm. Notice the bullet has in, intruded, and then energy has been absorbed mm. outward. Look, mm. at, look at that energy ring. That, that energy ring, is that what has actually spread out and dissipated the energy? Yes, and maybe we can see it more clearly in this block that we shot earlier. Okay, here, oh yes, it's very clear. In fact, there appears to be more than one ring. Uh, there are at least two or three rings going around in the circle there. That's right. And notice also that there's a deformation inward by the bullet. Look at that mm. bump on the back of the block. Around. Oh yes, look at that. That's very much the way the aramid fabric uh, behaved when it hit the clay. Are there bullets that will not be stopped by this, that will just go right through it? Oh yes, and there's also bullets that will ricochet off. But keep in mind that this plastic material and the aramid fabric that we saw earlier can and have saved a number mm. of lives. Well, thank you very, very much for coming and for giving us a high-caliber demonstration today. We'll have more in a minute. Back in the audience now for our next question. And this time it comes from... John Pinatello. John, you had an interesting question. Share it with us, please. Yes. Um, what is heartburn? 
and is it my heart that's really burning? <laughs> Get a heartburn off from these? <laughs> Interesting question. And here to answer it is Dr. Jan Siri, biologist from McAllister College. Welcome again, Jan. Thanks, Ira. I see you have Ernie with you. Yeah, I came along. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get right to the question. What is heartburn, and what really is going on? Well, it isn't your heart that's burning. <laughs> it's your esophagus that's mm. burning. And your esophagus is by your heart, so you may think it's your heart, but I it see. isn't. Um, Ernie brought his esophagus with him tonight. Good to see that. This is his esophagus. It's the food tube that uh, takes the food down to the stomach. This is his stomach, and this is his small intestine. Now, we've lowered the stomach and made it a little larger so you can see what's going on. Mm. Mm -hmm. The stomach secretes acid, hydrochloric acid, and that's probably to kill bacteria in your food, but it's a sort of a hostile environment. Um, the stomach protects itself from the acid by secreting mucus. But um, normally, the stomach contents stay in the stomach, but sometimes they can regurgitate a little bit back up into the esophagus. Now, the esophagus isn't protected from that stomach acid, and then that causes pain, and it hurts, mm. and it's that that's, sensation that's of heartburn. heartburn. Yeah, mm. exactly. Yes. Now, to demonstrate to you exactly what happens, uh, or sort of close to what happens, <laughs> in heartburn. I'd like you to take one of these eggs and crack it into that beaker. All right. Okay, now... Making an omelet here, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> what's okay, going on? Now, what's in the beaker is acid, and the acid is about 100 times stronger than what's in the stomach, and that's just to speed the process. But this happens in the um, stomach as well. Now, the, the, the egg white is turning white. Exactly. It's the cells of your esophagus are made out of the same things as these eggs are, and that. when they're exposed to acid, they start to coagulate. Mm -hmm. You can see it's almost as if this egg is cooking. Yes, Okay. Yes. That's the damage that gets done when acid is exposed to living cells. Uh -huh. Now, what kinds of foods cause this kind of reflux back up into the... Well, anything that causes the stomach to secrete more acid, like spices, mm -hmm. okay, will do it. Or some, kind, some foods relax that valve, and that's uh, fatty foods, chocolate, uh, mm -hmm. nicotine has that effect, From too. From smoking? Yeah, right. I, is there anything you can do about it? I mean, take well, antacids? you can take like antacids. That helps reduce the acid content, and also drinking fluids when you eat. It helps wash the yeah. acid back down into the stomach. Well, thank you very much, Jan. Uh, Ernie, welcome. I hope you feel better next time you're here. <laughs> <laughs> now for our journey back in time. Selected short subjects in science and technology that some people would like to forget. As if those hot summer nights aren't restless enough, Junior is getting his teeth. And when Junior is unhappy, everyone in the house hears about it. But here is one mom who isn't going to lose any sleep. At the flick of the switch, it's rock -a bye baby in Junior's room. The baby rocker is powered by a motor attached to the legs of Junior's cradle. But will that gentle rolling motion soothe Junior and send him back to sleep? Well, he stopped crying, and that's half the battle. And back in her own bed, Mom can roll over and rest easy, knowing that all is well. British, it seems, have their parking troubles, too. At any rate, an Englishman has figured out this ingenious method for getting that car out of the way. It's all very simple. You do the whole thing by pressing buttons. So far, it's only gotten to the model stage, but it's a nice idea. In the U.S., whose problem is a little more pressing, the same general idea is in actual operation. The car elevator can really handle cars, but quickly, as you'll see right now. No traffic congestion here, and it's a whole lot better than getting a ticket. We've come outside to meet our next guest. We're here at SeaWorld in Orlando, Florida, and surrounded by water, because that's where our next guests live. <laughs> the killer whales. <laughs> I'm with Thad Lucidic, who's head of supervisor of animal training here. Welcome, Thad. What are their names? This is Shamu and Namu, both Shamu killer whales. Killer. Well, they're mm -hmm. beautiful animals. How big are they? Well, they weigh about 5,000 pounds, and they're about 15 feet, 16 feet long right now. Now, when they're fully grown, they can get up to about 14,000 pounds, and and be about uh, 
uh, 30 feet long. Why are they called killer whales? I mean, they certainly don't look ferocious up here. Well, it's a name that was given to them by the sailors years ago. They called them whale killers because they observed them killing other whales in the wild. And the reason, <laughs> main reason they got that name is because they are the top predator in the ocean. They eat just about anything they want to. And no one eats them, huh? And nobody eats them. The old joke, what does a killer whale eat? Anything it wants? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. They eat anything from fish all the way up to blue whales. They eat a lot of different animals that are even on land, such as polar bears. They'll break through ice flows and grab okay. polar bears or slide up on beachheads and grab walrus or sea lions. Is that why they have the big teeth that they have? Well, that's one of the reasons okay. why they have those teeth, yeah. They use their teeth to grab their prey with. They huh. have 44 conically shaped teeth. They all fit like this so that when they bite something, they actually scissors it right off. Mm -hmm. um, and they just swallow the chunks whole. But they look like, like such gentle animals. I mean, you wouldn't think that they're killer whales, you know? They well, they are they don't gentle. Attack people, do no, they? no, they, they don't attack people. There are few, very few incidents of a killer whale ever attacking a man. And we believe that the times that it has happened, which has been a few times, have been caused because the animals mistook them for something else, a sea lion or a walrus. It's usually happened to surfers with wetsuits on. And as soon as they grabbed a hold of them, they'd let them go. And where do they come from? Well, killer whales are found in all oceans, and they travel in groups of anywhere from 10 to 50 animals. What do you call that group? Is that a herd? It's or? called a pod. A pod. Well, here at SeaWorld, they go through behaviors. They go swimming, and they go jumping up in the air, and uh, do all kinds of wonderful acrobatic tricks and actually come out on this. Is this a natural behavior coming We call them behaviors, like? not tricks. <laughs> <laughs> but right. it is a very natural behavior. This is one of them called mm -hmm. a slide out, where they actually slide up onto beachheads or ice flows and grab their prey. That's mm -hmm. one of the reasons they do that. Mm -hmm. They also like to play up here a lot. They push each other around in the slide out and push each other back. We're going to show you another one right now. I'm going to send Shamu back over to Chuck. He's going to send them all on a very natural behavior that we do also. What's this called? It's called bows. Okay. And, uh, let's, let's turn around and watch what he's doing here. Okay. Oh, that was beautiful. <laughs> They can reach speeds of 35 miles an hour in the ocean. They look like they can maneuver them. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, they like to jump up here. <laughs> well, they almost look like they were playing around with you when they came up here and jumped on top of you. You know, I noticed you didn't give them any reward. You didn't give them a bunch well, of fish when they came up. That's back what I'm doing here. right now. This, is what, them on yeah, this is what they like more than anything. We use this whistle right here to tell them that they did the behavior correctly, and then we give them different types of rewards that they enjoy. This particular whale really likes to have his tongue shook. Why don't really? you go ahead and shake You're his tongue? shake his tongue? That's it. There you go. You like that, don't you? You like that? Yeah, I know you do. Now, you mean, uh, you say this whale likes to have his tongue shake. Does this whale over here also like to have Not it? quite as much. Namu doesn't like it quite as much, but Namu really likes to have his belly button shaken. Why don't you guys come over here? That's it. You come over here now, and I'll you rub you down. You have to know which animal likes to have what done to him? Well, you have to, because that's a come very important part of how we train the whales. Why don't you come on up here again? <laughs> Attaboy. So you really have to be then a whale psychologist. You have to know what they want and their individual needs, and, and it's important to have this contact with them. It's very important. It takes us anywhere from three to five years to build a relationship with killer whales, to get to know them well enough to allow them to do the types of things that we do with them, getting in the water. And they really enjoy this physical contact that we have with them and all the different types of things that we can do for them. Um, they get all the food they want every day. Like I said, they get anywhere from 150 to 200 pounds a day. And uh, we use all these different types of rewards. You know, they really like to have you crawl on top of their backs, scratch them down. <laughs> As you can see, they enjoy this a lot. You go ahead and scratch that one down. I'll scratch this one. Well, I mean, this is the closest I've ever gotten to a killer whale, and I'm not afraid of them one bit. There really is no problem with them. Thank you, Thad. Sure. For uh, taking uh, the demythologizing of killer whales for us. Hi. I'm Mark Smith from Cambridge, Massachusetts. I watch Newton's Apple on WGBH Boston. I'd like to know what comets are made of and whether they could hit the Earth. Are they dangerous? A good question, because it may sound hard to believe, but this gas mask is of the kind that was worn by people in 
1910, they bought them to protect themselves from Halley's Comet. They actually thought that the comet would envelop the Earth in poisonous gas. Now, we get lots of questions about comets sparked by the return of the most famous of them all, Halley's. So, here to separate the fact from the fiction is Dr. Harry Shipman, an astronomer from the University of Delaware. Welcome to the program, Dr. Shipman. Glad to be here, Ira. Do we really need a mask like this when we look at comets? No, you don't have to worry about comets. <laughs> Let's get They're rid not of it. Hurt you. Let's get rid of that. <laughs> what is then inside of a comet? The guts of a comet is a dirty snowball. How dirty is it, as they say? Real dirty. Let's make one. <laughs> all right. What have we got? All the ingredients for We've a comet? We've got all here? the ingredients, and I've got a recipe card right here. We start out with a couple pounds of ice, which is there in that bowl. Just Plain like old you... ice in the bowl. And then we add some dry ice to it. We dry know ice? there's carbon monoxide in comets. Mm -hmm. and and that presumably comes from dry ice, which is frozen carbon dioxide. We've got mm -hmm. a bunch of other stuff here that we can add to it a little nice bit Nice amount later. of dry ice. Nice amount of dry ice. Then we want to add a quarter of a cup of motor oil. Motor oil in a comet? Well, we're not talking about dead dinosaurs <laughs> up there in comets. Was this 10W30? <laughs> but they do, they do contain a certain amount of organic matter. Right. And the okay. organic matter, the best we can do is to bring in some motor oil. They also got some dust in them, so we got some good old Frozen black dirt. Dirt. And we got some sand. Some sand. Throw that around. And throw that around. We're Ooh. almost there. Oh, it looks like a vapor. It looks like the tail of the comet forming here. That's exactly what happens. That when something like dry ice comes in close to the sun, it heats up and it starts to evaporate. But we got a few more things we got to add to that tail. We see some metals in it. Gross. So we've got to add some nickel. nickel. All right. And we got to add some iron. Firelings go in there. What a recipe. And then we've got a little bit more organic spice to add. We've got some graphite. We've got some asphalt. Wait a minute. Asphalt in space? Well, we're not talking about highways to heaven. This is just more <laughs> organic material. Okay. And then we've got a little bit of mixed minerals to take into account. Does that do it? Stuff. That does it. And then we mix gotta it up. Mix it up real well. Get our dirty snowball, huh? That's right. This is really. Now, where would a dirty snowball like this reside in outer space? Where would it come from? Well, we find a lot of these things that are out in what's called a comet cloud. It's about a quarter of the way to the nearest star. Mm -hmm. And then every once in a while, a passing star will give one of these snowballs a nice little nudge and send it hurtling into the inner part of the solar system, where then it comes uh, closer to the sun. The sun will heat it up, and oh. it'll start boiling off all sorts of carbon dioxide and dirt and all that kind of thing. Well, there it is, the dirt part, uh, but the, I don't see the famous tail that we always see on a comet. How does the tail get formed on the comet? Well, when it comes inside the solar system, all this gas is produced, but to see the tail, we've got to take a look at a model of the solar system. All right, let's go. Works. Aha, uh -huh. I see your model. Sun, Earth. Sun, Earth, comet out there. And behind me is a picture of the comet. Ooh, that, which comet is that? It's a beautiful comet. This is Comet West, probably one of the best comets to appear in the 1970s. Now, which part of the comet is our dirty snowball? The dirty snowball is found right up there, On the right head. in the head. So small you couldn't even see it in a picture like this. Now, you get the impression from looking at this comet picture that the comet is just going to streak across the sky like a meteorite, like a shooting star. And if you look for it, it's going to be and gone forever. That's nope. not how it works, right? No, nope. a comet just sits there in the sky the same way the moon does, or a planet. The Chinese call them broom stars. But it is moving slowly. It just it, looks at, at that time like it's staying in one that's place. That's right. It does move slowly through the solar system. And let's take a look at this model and give you a bit of an idea of how it moves. All right, a comet started way out there. This could take years, this journey around It could here. take years for Halley's. It's 76 years. And we bring it in, and let's stop it right around here so you can see oh, what's happening. That's the tail. Point. That's the tail. And now the solar wind, a flow of high-speed particles that flow away from the sun, is pushing this tail out, away from the comet. I see, and that's what's creating the tail. And as we bring it around toward the front of the sun here, at least get it this far and stop it. At this point, what, the tail is leading the comet? It's not the tail behind. is leading the comet because the tail has to point away from the sun. When the comet's moving away from the sun, the tail is pointing in the same way the comet's moving. Mm -hmm. And how could you go about seeing a comet? What is the best way to observe the tail on a nucleus of a comet? Like well, that? let's take a look at some of the pieces of equipment that I brought in. You've got some very interesting telescopes here. We sure do. These telescopes you'd really only need if you were wanting to look at the 10 comets a year that come by that are so small that they're below naked eye visibility. But for most comets, this is all you'll need. Pair of binoculars. Pair of binoculars. Maybe mounted on a tripod like yeah, this? If you got some real big binoculars, you're going to want to put them on a tripod. But the ones you're looking through right now are the sort of binoculars that uh, most people have lying around their house. So you don't really need fancy equipment. You don't really need fancy equipment. What about just the old naked eyes? Well, if you got a real bright comet, 
like Comet West, mm -hmm. the eyes is all you need. And how do you go about then looking? How do you get the best view for the comet? There's one key thing, is you've got to get far away from the city lights. Yeah, you usually have to do that for all good astronomy. That's right. For, for a lot of things you need to, unless you're looking at the moon, which mm -hmm. is really bright. Mm -hmm. But I brought in a picture of a comet. And if we take a look at it with the studio lights down, you can see that That's it looks beautiful. really nice, very spectacular. This is out in the middle of a field or where it's dark, you can see the stars. This is this out is in the middle of a field. You probably couldn't see all this because a mm -hmm. time exposure photograph can pick up a lot that your eye simply can't pick up. And as you get closer to a major city then, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. Let's bring up the lights and now mm -hmm. you can see that the comet is all washed out. You can barely see it at all. There's mm -hmm. lots of cases with Comet Kohotek where people could see it very nicely from way away from the city, not at all from in the city itself. Mm -hmm. Now, to repeat again, there's really nothing then dangerous. A comet is not going to crash into the Earth and blow it up no, like many people think. a comet think. is not going to crash into the Earth. Every once in a while, there's little pieces of things that hit the Earth and dig out craters, but nothing to really worry about. Of course, that didn't stop people from selling Halley's Comet Pills. <laughs> These are little sugar-coated candies, which were sold around 1910, and they were supposed to ward off comet sickness and make profits for the people who sold them. And they've come around again as a fundraising device. Well, they, they may be uh, not good for warding off comets, but they might keep you well-fed while you're out watching them. That's right. Thank you very much, Dr. Shipman, for that tale about comets. We'll be right back. Fascinating fact number 162. Nostrils. Even your nostrils need a breather. In fact, during normal breathing, they work in shifts. As one nostril opens up and does most of the work, the other closes down, letting less air pass through it. A regular shift is two and a half to four hours, but the older you are, the longer the cycle. No one knows why your nose divides up the work this way. What is it that keeps this wheel spinning? All of these machines, in fact, appear to be in perpetual motion, turning without any apparent source of outside power. Is this possible? Well, that's what Sheldon Rudman of Dallas, Texas, wanted to know, because he wrote us asking, with all the controversy concerning perpetual motion machines, could you please explain how they work? Okay, we'll try. Here to help us with the answer is Dr. Jack Patterson from Iowa State University at Ames. Welcome to the program, Dr. Patterson. Hi. Good to see you. Hi. What is a perpetual motion machine? A perpetual motion machine is supposed to be able to make up for the energy that it loses because of its motion. Mm -hmm. Now, is that possible to do? In a word, no. <laughs> <laughs> that means it would run forever. If it, it would perpetual. run forever, that's where the word perpetual comes in. Now, why is that not possible? Well, it's because of a law called the conservation of energy. Mm -hmm. And simply put, it says you can't get something for nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And really what it means is that if you don't put energy into a machine, it will use up the energy that's in it, and it will grind to a halt. Just like taking your foot off the accelerator in a car exactly. is eventually going to stop running. Exactly. I think we can demonstrate that nicely. If you'd like to sit down here, okay. we can show a simple kind of a machine called a pendulum. It's a bowling ball on a wire. All right. Okay. And if you'll press that against your nose, uh -oh. we're going to let this ball swing and lose energy as it pushes air out of the way and so forth. And if it doesn't lose any energy, It'll come back and touch your nose again. Uh, <laughs> I'd better have faith in the laws of physics. Well, uh, I've always wanted to see if this is going to work. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead go. and let it go now? Uh, don't flinch, Ira. Oh, <laughs> that was close. Well, but it lost. But the conservation of energy has been upheld in this Here. little experiment. And if we leave this thing run indefinitely, it will s it'll swing to a halt. It will grind to a halt and stop at the bottom. Then I guess a perpetual motion machine then tries to violate the law of conservation. Exactly. If there was an outside source of energy or power coming into this thing, it would give a little boost, and then it would swing a little higher and a little higher. And that's actually the objective of the people who are working in this area the perpetual motion. And they've been trying to do it for years. This is not something new, right? Centuries, absolutely. Let's go over here and look at some of these examples over here on the board. This is the first one. Uh, as we all know, a water wheel will work uh, by a river in a stream. Mm. This is one, however, that was built to work away from a stream. 
The energy is consumed from the water falling down, turns the shaft, and pumps its own water back up, and then runs around. These don't even start. <laughs> but there's a genius idea. Why not just recycle the same water and use it over and over again? In a way, in, until you build one of these, there's no real way to know that it wouldn't work. Because we're, we're not putting any outside power in, in this closed exactly system. Right. That's right. exactly this right. This one now, up here is intriguing. Right, that's right. And here's how it's supposed to work. It's supposed to continue turning around. As these weights fall out to the right, further away from the center, it would appear that they should overbalance the wheel to the right at the expense of these, and the thing should run forever. But as we can see... It doesn't do that. It just doesn't work. Wow. Very powerful, intuitive uh, concept You would here. think it should. And, yeah, you look at it and you say, it's got to work. But it's losing more energy, and it's not putting it back exactly. into the system. Right. And if we put more of these on here, it'll lose more energy. Yeah. There's another very uh, interesting experiment over here based on buoyancy. Uh, we have the same type of wheel almost in a tank That's of water. That's exactly right. And we have uh, balloons connected together through these tubes, uh -huh. and if we squeeze one balloon shut, it'll pump up the balloon on the opposite side. I see. The idea now is to get both buoyant balloons on the one side and all on the collapsed side. ones on the other side. So, so when these become we... buoyant, they would push watch, the wheel up. Watch the ones over the... Uh, this one that here? One, that's right. It'll squeeze down and it blows up the other one. And when the air goes through and the And you pipe, can see it starts oh, to turn. Yes. Well, doesn't but that work? It stopped. <laughs> <laughs> You'll notice that it stopped. And the reason is there's an awful lot of losses in pushing the water around, not air this time, but the water. Yeah. And uh, as a matter of fact, the thing just doesn't you, work. You, you can't make up for the loss of energy in the, in the water by because exactly. we're not putting any outside energy in. It gets to a in. point where it needs more energy coming in to get over the hill. But, uh, you know, it, uh, once again, you'd say, give me a few years. I could yep. perfect the size of the balloon or the... Look the at it on a drawing, and you'd be convinced it would work. Mm -hmm. Look at it inside of a tank of water. Yes. And it's quite another story. Well, if we can't get a free lunch, if we can't get something for nothing here, can we get a good bargain? Yes, I mean, you can get a good price on some lunches. That device <laughs> that you had over there to begin with in the show is an example of that. This is a legitimate machine. It stopped running. It stopped running, but if you'll charge it up again, stick it in the hot water, and get some heat energy into Ooh, that brass wheel, it'll cause, it causes a flexing in this interesting alloy uh, called nitinol. This, this uh, wire right that's here. That's right. That's the working substance, and it just starts turning it. And if you pull it out, as long as the brass wheel stays hot, it's got energy in it, and that energy is being used up as this thing continues to work. But it's not perpetual motion. It's not perpetual motion. It's coasting to a stop. It will stop eventually when this cools off. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, th let's, let's move on to the machines over here because, uh, to yeah. me, they look almost like perpetual motion, especially yeah. the uh, bicycle wheel up here. I don't see any outside input of energy like we know there has to be. Well, and, this uh, is uh, the argument from design here. Actually, we've <laughs> tricked you a little bit. <laughs> you tricked them. <laughs> and uh, we, have, we have magnets on the uh, outside rim. Oh, I and can as see they them come now. down close to the bottom, we pulse a magnet inside and actually tug. We tug on the magnets as they come down, and you'll see... Oh, that right there, there it is. inside. It's our electronic hamster. And if we, had, if, we had, <laughs> if we had cheated like that on the bowling ball and given a little kick on the way over to your nose, you'd have had it in your eye. And we would have been doing this from the hospital. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> what about these other machines? Are, are we cheating? Are they cheating in all these machines? I'm uh, afraid to say that they're all... A little bit funny. Oh. If you pull that top off, you'll see... There's the battery and the magnet again. That's right. They're getting power from the outside source into the device that's moving, and they can run as long as the battery works. Well, I can see how somebody can be fooled. Are people still being fooled by perpetual motion? They machine? certainly are, and people are losing a lot of money every year. In no this kidding. Thing. People approach them to invest in it, huh? That's exactly right. Whereas there is really no such thing as perpetual motion, we will always have with us perpetual commotion. <laughs> Thank okay. you very much, Dr. Patterson, right. for taking the mystery out of perpetual motion. Now, to keep the motion of our show going, we'll be right back. Back in the audience now for another question, and this time it comes in a letter from Paula Mann of State College, Pennsylvania, who writes, what is a wart? How do you get them? Can you really get them from toads? I like those questions. Here to answer them is Jan Seary, our biologist from McAllister College. Welcome to the program, Jan. Good Thanks, to see Sarah. you again. Thank you. He's making an awful lot of noise. Yes. This is a toad, mm. and I brought him on the show to demonstrate to you that 
I'm holding him. I'm not afraid of getting yeah. warts. You can't get warts from toads. I'll touch him. How come then that there's that mythology about well, getting warts? Well, if you notice, he toads. does have little bumps. Yes, and they he does. do. And I think people think that those are warts and that they're contagious and they'll spread. But no, you don't get them from toads. So where, so where do they come from then? Well, they're caused by a virus. A virus. Now, I brought a model of the virus that causes warts. Ooh. This is a papilloma virus. This is a big virus. It's about 100 million <laughs> times bigger than the actual virus. It has protein around the outside and DNA, genetic material on the inside. And it invades the skin cells and causes them to grow into a wart. Mm -hmm. And there are um, all kinds of different kinds of warts. Some, the common wart you get on your hands. And then I think a lot of people know about the planter's wart on the right. bottom of your foot. Well, if it's caused by a virus, does that mean it's contagious or that it, it can spread on your skin? Yeah, it can. It can spread on your skin and it can actually spread from person to person. Oh. It is contagious. But most people mm -hmm. are immune to warts. And so people don't generally have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. so, and, that and that explains why uh, you can outgrow warts when yeah. you're a kid? You yeah, get your immune system gets better as you get older and mm -hmm. so you don't have to worry. Well, what about the fighting off warts then? I mean, if you get them like that caused by viruses, viruses are very hard to overcome. Yeah, they are. Yeah, extremely hard. And so a permanent cure for warts, we don't have yet. Mm -hmm. People are working on it. But until we get a permanent cure, you can excise the wart itself and doctors do that by burning it out or by using a laser beam on it or by cryosurgery that's uh, freezing, freezing it yes. off. Yeah, and various uh, treatments. There, of course, have been treatments for warts for a long, long time, folk remedies. And I brought some <laughs> of those along, I too. recognize some of these. Okay, rubbing a penny on it and, and rubbing a potato or a carrot or even a dandelion on it. And people and, swear by these, don't they? Well, they do swear yeah. by them. Now, at, on the face of it, you'd say, well, of course, there's, there's really no scientific evidence for this. But there's a growing body of scientific evidence that what you that if you believe that something is going to happen, some physical cure is going to happen, like you believe you're going to get rid of your warts, that that triggers something physically in your body. Yeah, that your brain, in your, in your nervous system. Yeah, that your brain is able to trigger your immune system so mm -hmm. that it overcomes the virus better. Just mm -hmm. believing it may actually make it so. And that's why if you believe these may work, then you may get rid Yeah, of maybe. It's a possibility. Well, thank you very much, Jan. Thank you, a toady friend. I think Dead Ernie is going to be really jealous today. <laughs> no, <I hope not. laughs> you know, they say that history repeats itself. Well, if that's true, keep an eye out for the return of these next historic moments. Now there's something. It might be an epoch-making year in the Earth's history, also the moons and maybe Mars, if things had gone right for the enthusiastic inventor of the world's most amazing stratogyroplane. Built to leap into the stratosphere and just float there while the world revolved beneath it, either that or to whir its way up to the Milky Way, the odd craft had an auspicious launching. Strange. It should have been at least five miles in the air by now. There must be a screw loose or something. You can't phase a really determined inventor, though. He just smiles at minor mishaps. Imagine walking home from a stratosphere ride. Another V-2 rocket is prepared for launching by the Army Air Forces at White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico. A world's altitude record of 104 miles has been established here, and the U.S. is fast catching up in rocket warfare. Something's wrong. The rocket is dropping down off course. A rocket boomerang. So much for modern technology. Now, for our next segment, we went underwater for a close look at animals who are rather dangerous to get close to. Where can you be surrounded by sharks but in absolutely no danger? Here at SeaWorld in Orlando, we're in the tube in a shark encounter with curator Frank Maru. Welcome to the program, Frank. Thank you. How deep are we underwater here? Right now, we're 16 feet below the surface of the water. Mm. If we go upstairs to another viewing area, we can uh, get a better idea of just how big this facility really is.
It is big. Look at those sharks swimming around. I've never been this close to a shark and felt so safe before. <laughs> what kinds of sharks do you have in there? We've got uh, four different species of sharks in here. Uh, we've got about 30 sharks total right now in this part of the shark encounter. These classic looking sharks with the big dorsal fins are brown sharks. Bull sharks look somewhat like brown sharks, but bulls are bigger and beefier. Now the sand tiger shark looks ferocious, but it's actually not very aggressive. Then there are the nurse sharks, who spend most of their time resting on the bottom. We see there are other fish in the tank besides the sharks here. Do they eat these fish every once in a while? Well, occasionally they do uh, pick off one or two of them, but uh, for the most part we keep our sharks very well fed. Sharks are primarily fish eaters. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some that feed on invertebrates and different types of mollusks and that mm -hmm. type of thing. But, uh, but uh, we're going to have an opportunity to, you're going to have a good opportunity <laughs> to feed uh, some of these Me sharks. Me feed them? <laughs> you feed them. <laughs> All right, let's go. Okay, we're upstairs at the shark encounter now. A lot of sharks circling around this A lot of sharks. <laughs> I'm not getting too close. <laughs> We've got 30 big ones in here right now. Mm -hmm. uh, How do you feed we're them? We're going to... Uh, we're going to do that right now. We're going to take one of these. Take one of those. These are tongs. This is what we use to feed each of the each of the sharks with. And we have uh, some cut up fish in here. This is blue runner. It's good quality fish for them. Why are we feeding them like this? Why don't we just throw the fish in the water? Well, we do this for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that so that we can keep very accurate records, and uh, we'll know exactly. Oh. <laughs> He we'll just took it right away. <laughs> we'll know exactly who gets what, just like that one there. We'll take uh -huh. that and we'll record it on this sheet here. Uh, we also give a variety of vitamin and mineral supplements to them, and we want to make sure that everybody's getting a good balanced diet. We can't really tell once they get in a big swirl who got what, and also they, they could very easily damage one another because when they, they just kind of bite at anything that happens to be in the area, including each other. <laughs> <laughs> He hit me in the side of the arm. Did he get you? <laughs> yeah. He just hit me with his tail. Even after they've just been fed, these sharks still look hungry. But looks can be deceptive. Sharks both here and in the wild don't eat very often, one or two good meals a week. And contrary to popular belief, very few people have been attacked by sharks and even fewer killed by them. Still, the SeaWorld staff is extremely cautious. When sharks are caught in the wild, it's quite a job to be sure neither the people nor the sharks get hurt. Okay, we're using a technique called long lining, and uh, we're actually setting the long line. It's exactly what it sounds like. We're setting a very long line. It may have anywhere from 50 to 100 hooks on it with some very large pieces of bait. I'll these, say. <laughs> these are the baits that we're uh, setting on the hook now. They're very long leaders coming off of the, the main line. Well, by hooking, by hooking a shark, aren't you hurting it at all? Not, not much. Uh, it's uh, hook, usually hooked right in the corner of the mouth, and we found that the sharks actually have a very... Uh, quick recuperative period and uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't affect them much at all. Once we hook a shark and bring it in, we uh, put it in a, a stretcher and put it in a live well in the boat uh, where we can uh, assess mm -hmm. the health of the animal. Now then you put it in the environment over here, right? Right. Uh -huh. Now this is a very interesting tank and I think we ought to talk about it because it's not just a round circular big tank that a lot of aquariums have. You've designed right. it very carefully, very scientifically, right? Right. We, we did a lot of uh, research into the design of a tank before we actually built the shark encounter. Mm. Uh, we found over uh, a period of years of keeping sharks that uh, some of the circular configurations and the rectangular configurations create a lot of problems for the sharks. Really? Uh, they, first of all, they don't navigate corners very well, mm -hmm. uh, so a rectangular tank presented a, an unusual problem for a shark. And then uh, we found that a circular tank, the sharks would constantly circle in one direction, which over a, a large number of years would actually create uh, equilibrium problems and other medical problems for the shark. That uh, well, they, they lean to one side all the time? They, they really? tend to, over a long period of time, to, to lean to one side, or and we, it was almost impossible to get them to swim the other direction, so we couldn't correct that situation. <laughs> Does this tank make them swim in two directions? Right? This, this tank, because of its uh, kind of a modified dumbbell-shaped design, uh, actually forces the shark uh, at some point in his navigation of the tank to swim in the opposite direction. This pool is 125 feet long. The length is important because brown sharks need long stretches of water to glide and rest so they can rid themselves of metabolic wastes. In a circular tank, the sharks would have to swim constantly, always turning to follow the contour of the pool. And without rest, many would die of exhaustion. This is an important discovery. In fact, so little is known about the ocean-going sharks that it's important to keep and study them. Even the basic things like their reproductive cycles, uh, how long they live, 
Uh, we know nothing like that, and hopefully facilities like this will be able to give us the answer to some of those questions. This is more than just a beautiful exhibit. That's right. It's much more. Thank you very much, Frank Maru, for uh, keeping us on this side of the glass, at least this time. That's about all the time we have for now. So we'll see you next time on Newton's Apple. Newton's Apple is made possible by a grant from DuPont. Makers of better things for better living. And also by this station and other public television stations.